What's going on, everybody? It's uh, episode 35 of Collider Heroes. I'm John Schnepp, and you're entering a world of superheroes and villains. We're going to talk about all the TV and movie uh, news that's come out this week and some other cool stuff. Uh, with me this week, we've got special guests, Robert Meyer Burnett. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, thanks for By joining way, us. By the did you see the pictures that dropped today of the Hot Toys Darth Vader? I did not. The the A New Hope Darth Vader. Oh, is that somehow different than the other? It's different than the sideshow Return of the Jedi Vader. You know what? We were talking about this. Let me introduce Amy Dallin, <laughs> our other special Hello. guest. Hey, what's going on? Uh, thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, thanks for both of you being here. Uh, Darth Vader, here's a big question. This is kind of off topic <laughs> for hero stuff, but... Why doesn't he have a new costume? Couldn't they have like made like given him a weird red stripe or made him like maybe like chrome? That would have been sold at least another billion dollars. Well, there are the details toys. in his costume that yeah? change from film to film, like, like the what? Hebrew writing above the little chest plate really? that he had. Yes, and I'm sure that Hot Toys will duplicate these things exactly. Yes. Yeah, well, good like we've, that. You've They're heard that like from that. the Hot Toys sweat master himself, Robert Meyer Burnett. <laughs> I'm going to start off right off with the bang. Batman v Superman, the teaser trailer dropped last night. And, uh, you know, we're hearing rumor that Jimmy Kimmel once again gets the best trailers. I, I guess uh, tomorrow night he's going to have Batman v Superman, the world premiere of the full new trailer. But this one just dropped last night. It was a teaser. They showed it on Gotham. It also hit YouTube. That's how I watched it. I didn't have to watch Gotham. What did you guys, let's start with you, Robert, your first thoughts about the Batman v Superman, uh, Dawn of Justice teaser. Trailer. You know, I thought it was, it's really interesting because the milieu, like, is it in the Middle East? Where is he? Mm -hmm. Who are the, who is the Superman Gestapo that's holding him? How did he get held? He's being held with other people. Is he a terrorist? That costume is something we haven't seen before. Right. And Superman seems a little out of character. He's, he's kind of mad. Yeah. He's kind of angry and and it's not like he says, "Oh my god, you're Bruce Wayne." He just tears that cowl right off. Right. I thought it was look, I was intrigued. I, I thought interesting. Made me want to see it. Definitely. How about you, Amy? I it left me sort of where I was before, which is I hope that this movie's really good. I don't know a ton about it yet. I still don't know a ton about it. I hope that that moment will have a huge impact in the movie in context, but not a lot to go on right uh yeah the only things that i was able to glean from the from that teaser was a it had a lot of tension and it established immediately a very different tone from say civil war the trailer that captain america civil war movie had this tone from the batman v superman is they're not friends there's we kind definitely of knew that some, from the Batman v Superman thing, though. Well, v, the Batman v, it's not versus. It's like they're going to show up in court. <laughs> they I still are totally have an issue show up in court. with the, the title, but <laughs> um, they had no dialogue, and it was really literally a stare down. And it 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 held my interest for the whole time, like because you didn't know what's going to happen, and you still don't know what's going to happen. A lot of a lot of people are saying that's a dream sequence. I've seen that. Um, I don't believe it to be a dream sequence at all, especially judging from the very first trailer that we saw, where we see like desert camo Batman fighting a bunch of those Superman guards who have the the S shield. We don't really know what that's going to be. It does take place in the desert somewhere. Now, obviously, we we know that. Batman is captured somehow. We don't know if Superman knocks him out or how he's captured, but we do know that Superman is working with these guards. I don't know if this is one of the offshoots of like something where they hinted at in Man of Steel, where it's like, you know, I work alone, and maybe he is somehow working with a secret uh, military government operation somehow. I don't really know, but I think Batman did something to piss Superman off, and that's why he's so mad. Well, also, where... You'd ever see Batman in a desert milieu, which is no. sort of interesting. I mean, we have over the years in the comics, sure, to like Karak or something, one of those weird Middle Eastern DC universe right. countries that don't really exist. But why was he there? And clearly he has a new costume, not mm -hmm. the standard bat costume. He's right. got that high collar. It looks like he's wearing something desert. Batman now has desert apparel. It reminded me of Mike Mignola's kind of Gotham at midnight, right. like where you can, hey, we, you could change up Batman a little bit. He can operate with different costumes. But to me, the most he's interesting thing—he's big into thing, outfits. He always has. Yeah, he's always, he's, you know, makes a little. This is going to be one of those things where I don't think this is the. This is not the first time that Batman and Superman have met. Right. I think in the movie, this is probably going to be the second time, and then he actually pulls the cowl off, and he's like, realizes it's Bruce Wayne, and then the As third parent, time, you know, you know, his X-ray vision couldn't tell. Maybe, him. The, maybe it's lead lined the collar. <laughs> who, who knows? But. I think the third time will, is going to be Bruce Bruce Wayne in that mechanical armor, you know, Dark Knight outfit with a little bit of help from the, you know, kryptonite gloves or something. He's going to he's going to pop Superman a big one. He's, gonna, you know, I think it's going to 
It's going to be a big fight. have a lot of questions, though, about, like, what does this version of Clark know about Bruce Wayne? What does he think about Bruce Wayne? Is he familiar with whatever was going down that, like, Bruce Wayne... Does he know that, that the Wayne Industries building or whatever is one of the casualties from the big fight? I, I don't know. Right. That's, I'm sure he will find that out yeah. and maybe feel a little bit like bad about chaining him up in the in you know in the bottom of his installation as Superman Fortress of Solitude or whatever they're gonna call it. If this glimpse is the beginning of the sort of empathy that will eventually like cause I guess maybe Superman to like change his mind about fighting him and assume he's a good guy, then then it'll be worth it for me. But it's I think, sort of on its own. I don't know what to I make think of you it. nailed it on the head. I think that's what it's gonna be part of a chain of events. And I'm hoping that uh, tomorrow's full trailer will show a little bit more because obviously this little tease is giving us an opening into the, a little bit more of the storyline. So, well, what's interesting too is clearly there was a lot of thought put into what are we going to release. Yeah. So, so somebody actually thought long and hard about releasing this clip, and I think it's it worked in the sense that it's very intriguing. We don't know. There's a lot of people that, like you said, it's a dream sequence. Well, why do people think that? Did they read the script? Why is it a dream sequence? It didn't seem like a dream sequence to me because right. it wasn't shot like one. No. It was shot like a, a standard scene. And Superman looked angry and Batman was clearly not happy to be where he was at. But it made me intrigued. You know, wouldn't it be Jimmy a Kimmel. little nice to see those guys see each other for the first time in the movie when we're supposed to see it? This is my sort of crusade. Like a while ago, I stopped watching trailers and I've started doing it again. Right. But I'm sort of curmudgeonly about it where I'm like, I resent every piece of information I get. Um, but like it would have been kind of nice to save that for when you've earned it in context. I don't know if it's going to be the first time. I think that's a reveal of when you know Superman realizes that Batman and Bruce but seeing Wayne are the them same. them face to face with yeah. faces out. Yeah, that's... you know if that's a if it could be a spoiler. I mean for me like you know in the culture we live you know for the minute you yeah. you're on Facebook you some idiot has ruined Walking Dead for you if you haven't like, I, I haven't <laughs> seen the episode yet well you know so <clears throat> spoiler world territories for me. I'm, I'm kind of cool with like, yeah. hey, look, you know, we're going to all learn a little bit about there's almost impossible unless you go into a deep coma and then wake up right as the movie or TV show is playing. Will you not have something spoiled for you, whether you see it online or you watch something, you get a glimpse of something that you didn't want to see. So that's the world we live in. But as much as you can resist. I you know admire that. Well, I I've just given up give resisting because me. now people will just describe the trailers to you. Like I'll be at the comic book sure. store and people will come in and be like, "Didn't you love when blah happened?" And I'm like, "Now I kind of wish I'd watched the trailer." Right. Thanks for ruining it, Jerko. <laughs> no, yeah. but it's people being excited. No, and that's it's... but that that is part of the world we live in. People are so excited they want to share it with you, even though you're like, up, 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 up. It's like, yeah. Sorry, there's all these other people like, tell me more. So yeah. it's really hard to you know avoid well, it. <laughs> somebody uh, contacted me on Twitter, tweeted to me that they thought it was a, a slap in the face to fanboys. Every Everywhere that they put that trailer on with Gotham and my my whole point was that look it, it isn't show fans it's show business <clears throat> right and the thing is they don't need to get us we're all going right we're all gonna buy our advanced tickets we're going what they have to get is everyone else this is one of the most expensive movies in Warner Brothers history oh, yeah it's a big it's a huge I mean it's amazing to me how fanboys used to scream Batfleck horrible awful now they're all on his side now right. he's he's won them over before the movie even came out which yeah. is that was Guardians of the Galaxy had to win us over after it had come yeah. out we didn't believe in it and so watching this trailer I think it did exactly this teaser for a trailer right. did exactly what it was supposed to do and I thought it was a great business decision and why not put it on Gotham yeah I, I think it's better than Gotham. making you f nerds f forced to watch football which is what they did with the Star Wars Force Awakens <laughs> bored just looking at Twitter like ah there are those guys punching each other oh that other guy tackled the other dude whatever uh, oh it's still on it's like I forgot how interminably long football come on is. man did you watch the Pittsburgh Seattle game this weekend I don't amazing. know what you're talking about I don't watch sports and it's like I used to be in a sports when I was younger Rams out for the season or is this football or yeah, baseball it's football okay Seahawks <laughs> so Seahawks yay for them that sounds like hockey or something right it, it, it no all right well anyway <laughs> Sports, it's for it's not for me. Some people are the crossover. Yeah, but so I mean, some people it's... are like, dude, I get to see Star Wars and football. Yay! For me, I was like, jeez. The Seahawks are like them. Jedi Knights of the Pacific Northwest. Are the Seahawks football? And they're run by Paul Allen, one of the great geeks of all time. That guy sounds if you like want, a comedian. If, Paul Allen, ladies and gentlemen, you, playing at the comedy store. The Seahawks store. are the geekiest football team team of all time. The Seahawks and you should get some value, you geeks. The Seahawk. I am the Seahawk, and I shall destroy you, Aquaman. That scene sounds like a weird bird uh, uh, villain. 
for Aquaman or Hawkman. It is a little funny that your description peoples. of watching Monday Night Football was like, oh, it's people punching each other, some guys tackling, and I'm like, I'm not actually sure whether you're talking about the trailer or the football right now. Right. Well, I mean, you know what? People punching each other, that doesn't happen in football. That only happens in comic books. So <laughs> in football, people like tackle each other, and then there's a really long delay of 10 to 15 minutes with some interminable timeout, and they're like, oh, they've just reached fourth down. That means more time of nothing. Just wait until so. they have the Super Bowl commercial for Batman v Superman <laughs> and Captain America Civil hey, War. I'm a, I'll bring you it tune on. in where bring the Seahawks will be. Yeah, I'll be watching it on YouTube's. So moving on. So we covered the the very short teaser trailer of Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice. What we got last week, right after we recorded Heroes, was the full length first Civil War trailer, Captain America: Civil War. It dropped unexpectedly once again on the Jimmy Kimmel show. I was joking. He signed some deal with the yeah, devil. What? He gets all of the best trailers now, premiering all the time on his TV series. So this one was filled with incredible action, moving scenes. I got emotionally drawn into. But I couldn't believe how amazingly well constructed this trailer was that within the, the short span of like two and a half minutes, I could not wait to see this movie. And I was torn apart that Tony Stark and Steve Rogers aren't friends anymore. Remember, he was like, he's my friend. So was I. And then they're just p punching Iron Man. And you're like, what's happening to my favorite team? What are you, Amy, what were your thoughts? Civil War. I don't have a lot of super co coherent thoughts on this one. I already was 100% going to see this movie the instant it's available to me. I will right. continue to be incredibly excited for this movie. Uh, it was a great trailer. I Like I said, I, I try to avoid them these days, but I was on Twitter at the, at the same time, and I just kept seeing like, so much description of everything that was happening in it, and it... It's a great trailer. I'm excited for this movie. So you're glad you saw this trailer. Yeah. It didn't ruin too much. It, very, 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 it hardly ruined anything. Well, that's what's interesting is like we know a piece of what they're going to be fighting over, but there's a lot more that we don't know than we know. Right. Uh, and I, I hope that it, they will pull it off in a satisfying way. I assume, like, I feel like there's a very good chance that they'll put it off, pull it off in a satisfying way. The track record is pretty good. Um, I've been a huge fan of both of the previous Captain America movies. Uh, and I, yeah, I love these characters and I love their relationships and it totally, like, I have no critical faculties about it at all. Right I, I'm not a useful critique on this because I'm just so in. <laughs> that's 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 not a bad idea to be completely <laughs> in. I'm in too. What about you, Rob? Well, it's kind of like the Star Wars holiday special dropping Boba Fett for the first time. We got a little Black Panther. Ah, he looks and so good. I and gotta it's tell not you, like man. a holiday special at all. What? Uh, well, well, the first time you ever saw Boba Fett was in the Star Wars holiday well, yes. special. And he was badass. But the holiday special is garbage, and we don't want this movie to be. I know, but they... Uh, my, my, I know what you're comparing. They just drifted it. out. Yeah. Like, it was the first time. This is the first time. Like, they didn't even give him... He got a really quick hero shot with the sun yeah. behind him, yep. but it was so fast that you had to stop and go, wait, what was, what yep. was that? And, then a, and then, you, then a little kicking, and that was awesome. How many times did you rewind that and watch just... Black Panther. I throws that instantly it. went to gift status online. Uh, and I, you know, I put him up on my Facebook uh, header. You saw the running shot where Captain America's chasing Black Panther in an underground parking structure. Oh right? yeah, that's like like five frames. I, I mean, I it missed was, it the first few times. So I was like, wait a minute. You know, I, I got all hot toys sweaty because I wanted to. You asked, you said, Are you, have you pre ordered that? And I'm like, it's not up for pre order <laughs> yet. I don't, <laughs> don't know what I can do. Yeah, I was asking, I was like teasing Robert a little bit as I as I watch him go poor as he buys all these They're toys. so expensive, but they're, they're so, so good. They're so expensive. They're so good. But how it's cool incredible. was it? William Hurt coming back from the so Hulk. Great. Yeah, Thunderbolt Ross. Well, I mean, is back. unbelievable. And how cool is he? And you saw him pass over the Slovakia Accords, which yep. they actually stopped so you could read the Slovakia Accords. So it's not like Civil War with the new Warriors causing right, death. Right. You know, they've got a whole cool Marvel Cinematic Universe reason for Sokovia? the Civil War, reason yeah. for the, the, the Superhero Registration Act. I mean, and also, come on, that last sequence when the Winter Soldier hands cap the, soul, the, the, the shield so he can pummel Steve Rogers Throws even harder. Him. Yeah. I mean, come on. Pretty darn cool. I got to say, like, some of my favorite moments in it weren't even the action scenes. No. And I, and I really, I, you know, obviously I haven't seen the film, but one of my criticisms of Ultron, of Avengers Age of Ultron was the, the jokiness of it. it. Was the two, uh, while they're fighting, there were all these little jokes. Or there was like a, it's called a button, where you're like, have a button at the end of every scene. Like, oh, my leg. Or, hey, that's what she said. Or some little dumb joke that just, like makes it I feel like I'm watching a situation comedy where in just in this trailer alone I don't know what the movie is going to be like but in this trailer they handled certain sequences with the with a very serious tone even though like Tony Stark says I wish I could punch you know you and your perfect teeth it's a funny line but, but they, show, they show Steve Rogers reaction to it is not he's not laughing he's like bummed out that 
he so they just created this tension between Tony Stark and Steve Rogers, especially when he's walking down that hallway and then Iron Man comes out and you know it's about to go down, but he takes his helmet off. He's like, hey, what's going on, buddy? It's like, there's that tension built up. And then he's like, look, man, I'm trying to save my friend. And he's like, I thought we were friends. And you know, it's like that whole, that tension between those two characters is what I thought was the most powerful part of the entire trailer. Well, to speak to that also, the Black Widow moment when she says, look, you gotta stand totally. down. You, you can't punch your way out of this. Totally. And she, you can tell in her voice that she doesn't, She's got. It. She wants this to stop. Like this yeah. is bad, and you know that, especially after coming off of of watching these characters build up this teamwork and this relationship. There's even a little Hawkeye action in that trailer, a little mm -hmm. bit toward the end when they're all running at the yeah. end, and and you realize that what a smart move. I mean, for Marvel, we're going into now phase three. I mean, to tear these characters apart. It's mm -hmm. a perfect way to deal with them. I mean, Thor Ragnarok, we're not going to see these characters, right. I don't think. I don't, I don't think know. you're going to see Thor or Hulk in Civil no, War, they're which not is great. A, which is great, and they're gone. They're off doing their Hope and Crosby routine in <laughs> right. space or whatever. But, yeah, I want to see I think, that. Yeah. I do too, but but it, it really made me realize that this is a dire threat. And again, kudos to Marvel because it's a threat that is emotional. Mm -hmm. It's not, there's no Thanos, you know, right. pounding the ground. It's there's no villain. It's humans fighting humans and making calls and choices and, 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 and sides. It's and friends torn apart, you know. Anthony Mackie has some good lines as the Falcon where he's like, when they start firing at you, you know they're going to start firing at me next. Yeah. So it's like, it's all, as the teams are kind of forced to pick sides or just out of loyalty, they're like, look, where you're going, I'm going. We don't know how T'Challa or Black Panther, as he's called, is going to fit in. We haven't seen Peter Parker. We know he's in the movie. So there's all these what ifs are like, how, how are these other characters? Ant-Man's going to be in there. We know that they showed a big, very funny scene at D23 of him like sleeping in a van. He's like all excited to meet Captain America. So there's going to be levity. There's going to be humor. But what I loved about Captain America, the Winter Soldier and how the Russo brothers just annihilated. I think it's one of the best Marvel films. Uh, I just not think the best. Th yeah, it's just the tone alone of of all the individual superhero films of the Marvel universe. It Captain America Winter Soldier is my favorite. Avengers is obviously the team favorite for me, but the way that the everything that they were able to pull off with Captain America the Winter Soldier just elevated what they had already they didn't uh, Joe Johnson directed uh, First Avenger, but they just elevated the character, the man out of time and did such a good job of putting him in and then introducing the Winter Soldier that I can't wait to see what the how they this is obviously Captain America's movie. Everyone keeps calling it Avengers 2.5 whatever. <laughs> this is Captain America with the Avengers. And this feels like a really very obvious con continuation of the Captain America trilogy. Well, it grows out of character as it should and I think yeah. that's what the thing that makes that trailer work is that we don't know everything about the conflict yet but they've given us just enough to know that most people will either have will, they'll have a legitimate reason for either side like from what we saw of Widow from what we saw of Falcon we already know that like there's no wrong side here and it's going to hurt these people to come into conflict with each other and totally. that's what is going to make it great and that you end with the friendship line was just absolutely the right call right. Oh. and then them punching the hell out of each other it's like, I gotta go back to what you just said about Falcon I think what they've done with Anthony Mack and the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe is very cool because at first I remember reading an interview with him saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to come back. You know, they introduced him and he was so beautifully introduced at the beginning of Winter Soldier. Such a great yeah. scene. And he was clearly, I mean, he, it's now this might, this might should maybe Captain America and Falcon Civil War. Mm. And when you see the colors, when his when his wings, wings unfurl, it's the classic Falcon oh, yeah. no, that, red and white colors. That was my and little then, eight year old freaking I was like, I had that action figure uh, of I the mean, Falcon. Yeah, you know? remember the, the Migo figure, yeah, the Falcon? Man, I, had I mean that. I was like, all right. And um Migo figures are cool too. That's right. Um, but but then when you see that great move he makes, the, yeah, the and, and he retracts around. his wings, I mean, they gave him the big cool moment where a superhero does something badass where you go, man, that was badass. And I'm really, I'm worried. I hope that Rhodes doesn't get killed. They obviously show Iron Man holding War Machine, obviously injured and taken out. Maybe, you know, his power supply is taken out. He's just in the hospital in the next scene. I don't think they're going to show a death scene right off the bat, especially in the trailer. So no. I'm not okay. guessing that War Machine is going to be the one but who to kill If we that could not him. observe the law of conservation of black dudes where you have to kill off somebody as soon as a new one shows up, that'd be great. Exceptions to that law are always welcome. Yeah, I, I'm actually really happy with all the characters that are in this film. And I'm looking forward to like, you know, if anyone is going to die, like obviously a lot of people are like, well, if they follow the comic books, Captain America is supposed to die. I don't think they're going to do the obvious choice. I think they're going to kill Iron Man. That's my call. I, I think they're going to knock Robert Downey Jr. out of the picture, and he'll probably end up uniting the Avengers 
towards the end of wow. the movie to start the Infinity War. That's I never thought about that, but that's really interesting. But you know what? Kudos again to our Lord and Savior Kevin Feige mm -hmm. for knowing exactly what buttons to push. Right. I mean, the great thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is they take risks, like with Guardians and Ant Man. They can do course corrections because people talk about now Avengers: Age of Ultron, even though it made one point five billion dollars, is somehow disappointing. Right. This seems to be like a course correction, even though I don't think. It needed one, right. but it certainly it changed the whole tone of the cinematic universe in one trailer. Yeah, and let me say this: I don't, I don't, I'm not prescribing to them killing Iron Man. I would like Robert Downey Jr. to make Iron Man four, five, and six, or just call it something else: Iron Man, Demon in a Bottle, Iron Man. You know, you know, like I like that they're not numbering stuff anymore. They did that with Iron Man, and all the other Marvel films don't have a number, which is cool. I don't need numbers. I can like, hey, look, here's all of them. They could retitle Iron Man and just like the Ten Rings, and then recall just re-release them with new names or whatever. Do some new graphics or something but i'm saying robert downey jr is the core of what the cinematic universe of marvel is all about i don't want him to die i say give him 500 million and make him do avengers and four more <laughs> iron mans whatever the dude wants man you know what i mean was your own iron man castle some of your here's your island that we bought for you whatever he wants it's like it's so much fun to see his take on iron man and that's kind of what sold all of us on the Marvel Cinematic Universe yeah. was him. It wasn't Edward he Norton was as the Hulk. He was their first risk. Yeah, no. and he was Edward Norton and the success. Hulk was like, out of like, here, son, you're a little crazy, just like the Hulk, get out of here. So it was like, Robert Downey Jr., yeah, he deserves all that money. Some people would be like, nobody should get paid that much. Well, guess what? He should, I think. I was just like, you know, the world's unfair, it's a 99%, 1%, give him his little castle or whatever, he's Iron Man. So I don't, I'm not saying he should die in any shape, you know, I'm like, look, try to keep him alive, but if that's happened and it's running its course, if I had to pick my druthers, I'd say like Iron Man, get out of here. You know? Plus, so. you feel bad. You're like, oh man, him and Steve Rogers are like at odds, loggerheads. That's right. terrible. You've, I'm bummed out when he says, you know, I thought you were my friend. I mean, you're like, oh, no, I know. Actors, you don't make Robert. You don't you make really Steve, good you actors. Tony, you don't make Tony Stark mad at you. No. Oh, it's bad. Yeah, he's supposed to be making those quips. I know. All right, let's move on <laughs> to another subject that th this is like falls into the rumor mill. But uh, Green Lantern Corps is going to be a buddy space cops film, while Cyborg, which has been announced, is actually going to be transforming into the Teen Titans. So the DC Super Team Ups look like they're, they are going to be happening in the next few years. Cyborg turning into a Teen Titans movie, which I personally hope is going to be based on the Marv Wolfman, George Perez material. Um, and then the Green Lantern Corps is being talked about as being like kind of a buddy picture in space. It's like basically cops in space. Makes sense. The Green Lantern Corps are the space cops of the entire universe, all the universes. So it feels like it's like, who, who wouldn't want to see a lethal weapon in space with the Green Lanterns? Robert, how about you? What do you oh, think about Oh, uh, you know this? what? I thought that's what Phantom Menace should have been. Mm. It should have been lethal weapon and it should have been a mystery that they uncovered. You should have seen the Jedi kick behind at the beginning of the movie because we'd never seen Jedi before. Totally. Not the height of their power. Instead, they sit down in a room. Circular meetings what? for three movies. Yeah, it's it's not really good. exciting. But I think lethal weapon Actually, in space. I, mean, I call I'm it in. Star Talks. Instead of Star Wars, because that's literally what those three movies are, is a lot of walking and talking. Star Talks. <laughs> Which could have worked McGregor. if the thing they were talking about was more interesting, but also yeah. probably shouldn't have been what you did. Taxes and Trade Federation snore. <gasps> I mean, there's anyway. a way for that to be interesting. That has caused actual wars in the world, and yes. those things are undoubtedly dramatic, but you have to know how to present them for them to... Anyway, that's a different... <laughs> All right. So Green Lantern Corps. Well, no, I think, I think Lethal Weapon in Space is a great idea, just like... Captain America Winter Soldier was a 70s conspiracy thriller. You know, you take different genres and you sort of graft on the superhero films mm -hmm. to them. I mean, who doesn't love Lethal Weapon? Riggs and Murtaugh? No, I, love I mean, what a great idea for two Green Lanterns. One's new, one's, one's a young Padawan, perhaps. One mm -hmm. is an elder statesman. And they, they go out and they solve crimes. Have we them before at this point? Are they showing up in Justice League? Or? I don't you think know what? so. I think my guess is what they're going to do is they're going to introduce one of the two Green Lanterns of Earth and Hal Jordan is not going to be seen. He's going to be off, you know, in space doing something. And I don't know if it's going to be Guy Gardner, if it's going to be John Stewart. My guess is going to be John Stewart is going to be the Green Lantern who's on Earth, and he's going to have a little cameo. Is my it's just a guess. I'm not so that's how I would do it. I'd be like, let him roll in, name drop him. People would be like, the nerds would be like, that's just the Green Lantern. Everyone else wouldn't care. It's just part of the movie. Just make the blend it into the fabric of the DC universe. 
That's what they're doing. That's the whole idea of Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is to create a cohesive universe. Man of Steel helped establish this new universe that they're doing. And I think by bringing in Batman, by bringing in Wonder Woman, you can ha you can drop like a scene with Aquaman. You can have two references to Green Lantern and all these other things. You could just reference that. Look at how successfully Marvel has done a movie. Avengers Age of Ultron had like 12 main superheroes running around fighting in different parts of the world and no one blinked an eye and then in this batman v superman it was like what, how come wonder woman's in that's too many people it's like you gotta relax hang on wait till the movie comes out i think they know what they're doing i think they're going to introduce all of these characters in a very very natural way where it'll feel it won't feel like wedged in or or pushed i think that's my guess well it's interesting i mean I was watching Jessica Jones this weekend. Right. And the way they've sort of, how many meta humans are there in the mm -hmm. world? You know, you've got Luke Cage and Jessica Jones talking about they might have all come from the same place. They right. were created. Right. But the way they sort of, in conversation, they set up the idea that there's a lot more meta humans than we've met in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And they're popping up mysteriously. People are like, oh, it's another one of them. Right. And yeah, and they know. And I think it's really interesting that Batman v Superman, if they're going to establish the Atlanteans are already there, mm -hmm. like we already know, the world or or the Kryptonian battle that happened in Metropolis is what brought these people to the forefront. Like, oh, if there's aliens, we're now gonna introduce our presence. I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how Wonder Woman, how Aquaman are introduced and why shouldn't there be, okay, Earth, you were attacked by aliens, we're now gonna bring you into the fold. This is your space cop totally. of your sector. And it makes sense. Actually, assigning a Green Lantern makes more sense than... than right, I mean, there's a reason yeah. why the Green Lantern Corps is and now Earth is on their radar because there was this event and they knew who the Kryptonians were. So they came to Earth and like, oh man, we're really sorry. This should never have happened. Right, we, we should have been here. We didn't even know that you were here. Right, But then exactly. these guys showed up. So it the, makes total sense. The, the Buddy Cop movie actually sounds like a great idea. The only thing that I would hope that they would add to that is that like... A lot of great buddy cop movies are sort of down to earth, but uh, I, and I love that you said the the well, you were saying Hope and Crosby about the the Hulk and Thor rumors, but like if it is like it should be a road picture in space, yeah, because absolutely. what you need to take advantage of is of that backdrop, and this is a thing that like sort of a missed opportunity with the last Green Lantern sure. movie, but you can't just treat it like ordinary cops. They're in space having amazing cosmic adventures that should make all children and inner children mm -hmm. like weep with joy. Yeah, they should um, not so just be that on Oa. Element. Yeah, yeah, they should be jumping from planet to planet, from universe to universe. Or Oa needs yeah. to be really spectacular. Just something that says this is, it's cops, but it's cops in space with the limits only of your imagination. I like, agree, that's, that's a great way to surmise it. And if you introduce Darkseid, if he's really gonna be the villain in the Justice League movie, you've got, now you have Oa, now you have, and then you've got Apocalypse, and mm -hmm. you've got all the new gods, and you, there's there's a whole pantheon immediately in place, and you find out that Dark Side is basically the kingpin of the universe, and the right. Green Lantern Corps is being he hassles them all the time, and he's got all kinds of criminal enterprises happening all over the universe. Yes, yeah. and the Green Lantern universe, Green Lantern Corps, and albeit the DC universe, is a great way to introduce a lot of other characters like right. Lobo, like a lot of the other DC universe. Thanagar, Adam, and Adam Rand, Strange, and, yeah. Thanagar. So. Uh, going back to Cyborg turning into Green into Teen Titans is to me even more exciting than Green Lantern Corp. Because for my, myself, as a kid in the '80s, I loved the Teen Titans. I read every issue. Marv Wolfman, George Perez, Terra. You know that whole. I mean, How Deathstroke. I mean, every single issue was like my soap opera. That was my jam every issue i could not wait to read it and you know i haven't kept up with the teen titans now i do you know I, where i remember the teen, teen titans as you had Ch beast boy changeling or whatever you called him raven starfire nightwing robin then turned into nightwing jericho and cyborg and jericho to a lesser degree i didn't really like him that much the weird blonde well, he came later Afro. yeah he came later i was like hey, he's a but i have to tell you one of the things that really took away wonder my girl innocence, wonder girl my innocence was gone the Tara? spoiler alert yeah the Aww. Judas Contract storyline. Yeah, let's not go too deep into the Judas Contract storyline, but I agree with you that was crushing. <laughs> when that happened, oh I, god! I, I mean, when that first of all, they 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 set it up over a year. Oh yeah, and it was it was it was the first time that a, you know what it was. 
I realized that comic book storytelling could be epic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I read the X-Men at the same time. Remember those they were had the, the two, those, yeah. like, it's DC forgotten presents, by a lot of people, they, but, but teen, New Teen Titans and Claremont and Kenny X-Men were going on at the same time. They were, they were the top were. two books in all of comics, and they were, like, everyone's addiction. And rightfully so, because they were serving both of both different masters and at the same time the same, where they were both soap operas or both dealing with, like, Teenagers and things that teenagers could relate to. But for some reason, Teen yeah. Titans seemed more down to earth. Like they were my favorite superhero team. I loved the Justice League growing up because they were the big guys. But as I became a teenager myself, mm -hmm. I was 13 in 1980. I loved, I loved the Perez. I bought like the first 40 issues from some dude. I hadn't mm. read them. And I sat down over a weekend and read them and I was so invested. I was so involved. It was the first time that I got that invested in a comic book, in, in, in those characters. I loved those characters. You know, Wonder Girl, Donna Troy was married mm -hmm. to like a normal dude, which I thought was, wow, that's really interesting. She's married to like a normal dude. When did you ever see that in comic books? I mean, you knew that like, for instance, Phoenix and Cyclops were an item but they right. weren't like they didn't have you didn't see them having domestic life teen titans you saw that they had a domestic Who life was starfire dating she was dating nightwing we're nightwing right yeah i mean and starfire was always jealous of nightwing i was like i want to date starfire i was always <laughs> redheads were my thing still are i mean starfire was the redhead of comic books mm -hmm. more so than phoenix Ooh, because that's she a had this one. long i actually dated Vote a girl later people. that looked just like her nice orange and alien can fly was, she was just like <laughs> well, that she was a just she was like her. she was from russia so she was kind of an alien <laughs> so what do you guys think teen titans instead of cyborg i know also they're going to be introducing cyborg in batman v superman they've cast him so he's going to have a bit role i don't know what his role is going to you know how it's going to play out in the movie but i think now that they're like turning the wheel and they're saying look let's we have a everything that we're setting up we can have our justice league and our icing on the cake teen titans too why not do it why i always found it a little weird myself personally that i was like why do a cyborg movie that doesn't make any sense makes perfect sense if it's a teen titans movie what do so you, th what do you there, think? Two caveats for me. One is that I still don't know what's happening with they like announced a Titans TV project. I right. don't know if that's going or not. But the other thing is that like I think a Teen Titans movie makes more sense than a Cyborg movie. But it's going to be so disappointing if this is true to the people who saw like don't announce a Cyborg movie and then pull that away from people. There are a lot of people who were very excited for that, and they're going to get a PR roasting if this is for real for announcing their first black-led solo film and then taking it back. Mm. But they're going to kind of have that coming. Like, don't announce a big landmark first thing and then change your mind because people are going to be really sad, and you're going to have to deal with the fact that you created that sadness. Right. Uh, but, like, from a strict story level, I, I think Titan Titans could work. I'm, I have some doubts about the DC Universe and the sort of darkness of it. Um, I finally watched Man of Steel this weekend, right. and it's tough to imagine that as the foundation of a lot of things but like doesn't mean it can't be done right a lot of things i thought couldn't be done have been done in superhero movies so. i mean look at the tv world of dc comics right now that's that's very far from dark you have supergirl which well, is it has a light. range within it yeah there's a great. lot of range so i think that that is possible in the dc cinematic world as well i think it's going to follow obviously batman v superman directed by Zack Snyder is going to have that same kind of darker Man of Steel tone and it's also Batman who's dark in general so it's going to have a lot of darkness there I think there's going to be elements that are going to spring forth of, with light especially Wonder Woman I think Cyborg being announced and turning or transforming into the Teen Titans is less disappointing because Cyborg is in the Teen Titans so it yeah. feels it feels like a natural progression it's not like ah, oh, we pulled Cyborg now it's going to be some uh, now it's Lobo people are like hey that would be so a much bigger weirder, firestorm so well, I think also the, t the Teen Titans is sort of fundamentally in a way upbeat mm -hmm. I mean even though there was horrible stuff happening in the Teen Titans I always felt that there was somehow it was the bright side of the comic book universe. I mean, everybody, there was romance, there was, there was, um, people learned lessons. And at the end of the day, it never got that dire, even when it did get dire. Right. I mean, I always felt that I could go to the Teen Titans and I always had a, an uplifting time, if that made any sense, even though it wasn't always an uplifting comic, comic far right. from it, actually. Right. And I think of that kind of a movie, again, what a great castable group of, like whoever you cast in that role, whether it's Starfire, whether it's, I mean, are they gonna introduce Nightwing? Yeah. Because that would be, would it spin off from Batman v Superman? Certainly hope so. It could and be again, great. they've kind of been ignoring this, but they have an entire generation of kids who are going to be the exact right age for this movie who grew up watching the Teen Titans cartoon. It's totally. only a couple years to us, but it's their entire childhood. No, you're very right in that. It's like literally they're taking that base 
and then growing it and like here's now the movie like not version. serving them doesn't yeah. make any sense no i think it's it's smart on on dual levels to do the teen titans and do yourself a favor go right now check out amazon.com and get yourself teen titans by marv wolfman and george perez it's available in trade paperbacks if you live in any, anywhere near a comic book store go to that comic book store and get those trade paperbacks immediately you'll you won't be disappointed so it's gonna be on. new teen titans yeah probably new teen titans and it's marv marv wolfman and george perez those are the ones to buy their uh, late 80s uh next one we're going to talk about is spider-man begins shooting in atlanta and possibly Iron Man and Captain America to be joining him. Now, what's going on here? Let's just start off with Tom Holland said in an interview earlier this week that Spider-Man is pretty much the only secret identity hero that's left after Civil War. He's the one who keeps his mask on and no one knows who he is. It makes the most sense because the kid's in high school. You know, you know, he's not going to be wanting people to know that he's Spider-Man. And they're starting to shoot in Atlanta. So Atlanta's become the place to shoot all the superhero movies, especially Marvel. Marvel's built their base of operations there. They've built a basically they've built a fake New York that they could shoot on uh, that it's free for them. They don't have to sh close down sets in New York, which is $100,000 a day, if not more. Here it's basically free and they have New York in Atlanta. They just shot Civil War. They finished Civil War. They're going to start shooting in Infinity War. There's a lot of wars going on in Atlanta in superhero land, but they're going to start shooting that in like, you know, I guess March or April or May. Now, Spider-Man's already shooting. Robert Downey Jr. mentioned on the Kimmel show. Kimmel seems to be getting all these all those the hot leads. I don't know what's going on with this Kimmel guy. Um, Robert Downey Jr. mentioned that he and Chris Evans are going to shoot in Atlanta to shoot something else because he said we're already wrapped with Civil War. We're going to, we're just going to be going back to Atlanta really soon to shoot something else. Now, he wasn't talking about Infinity Wars, wouldn't it make perfect sense that Spider-Man's going to be in, in Captain America Civil War? Wouldn't it make perfect sense that Captain America and Iron Man would cameo in the brand new Spider-Man movie? Even though it's a Sony movie, this is the Marvel Universe Spider-Man. So to me, it's really, I have high hopes that they're going to cameo. What do you guys think, number one, about Spider-Man starting shooting already and Spy uh, Captain America and Iron Man possibly being in it? Robert? Well, I mean, come on. Yeah, I, know, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you, I, I hate this idea. It's uh, terrible. Yeah, I just think to myself, what world do we live in? We we live in a world of wonders. I mean, who would have thought? Like, we're actually on an internet show talking about Spider-Man <laughs> and, and cameos with Iron Man and Captain America, Madness. who we love. Impossible. No, uh, it's incredible. I, I mean, know. we live in interesting times. Um, but no, I think it's great, and I think that again. Sony needs to make sure that their Spider-Man is known. Look, we're not just making another Spider-Man movie. We're making a Marvel Cinematic Universe Spider-Man movie. It also says something about corporate cross promotion. Yes. If they're willing to do this, if they're it's a and if high Marvel, level of friendliness. Yes, there's yeah. a high level of friendliness and also if it's just as successful, it means that you can split Maybe there's hope for the X Men coming back. I mean, who knows if they can figure out a way to work. That's these things. never going to happen. I know, well, but I want it to. I it's know, but I'm just happen. saying that you know it, it. It does speak well of the world that we live in. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that we live in these times where Sony can make a Spider Man movie and we can actually see Captain America, our Captain America? It's not recast, right? But we'll see Steve Rogers. Well, and we'll see I'm just glad Steve. that Sony will be making a, a Spider Man movie that doesn't suck. So it's like, hopefully, with Kevin Feige and the entire crack team of Marvel headquarters helping the people out at Sony who've been hobbling around and doing really bad jobs at doing anything with uh, Spider-Man. They've mixed bags, which is almost worse. But. Yeah, so I'm like, look, I have really high hopes for this new version of Spider-Man. Right off the bat, when uh, Kevin Feige said, look, we're, he's going to be in high school, we're going to go back to basics, we're going to, like, you know, kind of take a Ferris Bueller's Day Off approach to Spider-Man, which I thought was a great idea. It's just like doing a kind of a, a stealth spy movie with Captain America. You're going to do a little lighthearted, a little bit more fun film with Spider-Man. And that's what Spider-Man should be. It's not, I'm not saying it should be Deadpool style, breaking the fourth wall, this and that, which they could possibly do with Spider-Man. It wouldn't be bad because Spider-Man is always kind of talking to the camera, kind of, you're part of my life. This is what happened to me today. People don't even know I'm in high school, but I'm also this guy. It would work so well. My only fear with Spider-Man right now, it's the two guys who wrote Vacation, and goddamn, that movie was horrible. Those guys wrote it and directed it. It was just not funny. None of the jokes worked. It was a bad movie, so it really bummed me out. So that they're writing Spider-Man, boy, you know. Trust in Feige. Fright. Kevin Feige hasn't let us down yet. No, I know, and you know, there's, you know, 
it's a lot to you know i'm hoping that you know they have a crack team of rewriters or that those guys just had a bad day and they were like hey we you know we were trying to make this vacation thing we were directing it and then all this bad stuff happened and it we wanted it to be funny because no one ever goes into a movie like i can't wait to make this movie suck boy i can't wait to destroy a franchise no one ever goes into no, any of kind of so. job wanting that to happen so just things probably happen that went out of control but I, as a consumer, seeing Vacation was really bummed out, not only from the two hours that I wasted not laughing watching that, but then also thinking about, oh my God, these are the guys who are writing the new Spider-Man movie. So it got me thinking, I'm like, all right, well, we'll just wait and see, you know? So my, my worry zone is there. Well, then but again, I, I guess, I, I haven't seen Vacation, so I don't know how much of a disaster it was, but there was uh, the movie, which I also haven't seen, whatever comedy the Russo brothers did mm -hmm. that most people were not big fans of, which was like their only feature credit before they went into uh, Winter Soldier. They had done community episodes right. which people legitimately loved, but then everybody went like, you got these guys from this comedy? And oh, granted, me. Winter Brothers Soldier's a totally different tone, but maybe there's hope and you're right. That, no, yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm just, just saying, a bad like, day no, when I heard the good. Russo brothers were directing Captain America, I was like, why did they get these community guys? I guess there was something in there that they saw that I didn't see, which is, you know, hey, more power to other guys who are hiring these people. Same thing with the Spider-Man guys. You know, obviously they wrote and directed Vacation. They did a pitch that won over all the people at Marvel and they were like, look, let's get these guys. And obviously there's, it's a tight, you know, they're probably very focused. So that's my hope. <laughs> One more thing that I, I just like Spider-Man and Civil War, this was my absolute favorite reaction to the trailer last week was when people are like, oh, but we haven't seen anything of the Spider-Man yet. And somebody, I wish I could remember who made the brilliant comment that the single best thing about the Civil War movie and the upcoming cameo is that it has real world editors slamming their desks going, get me pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. The, is like he in this frame? situation happening yeah, there's right people now. People like looking, is this him in a blurry <laughs> frame of the Falcon? He's got a red outfit. Well, you did see Scarlet Witch. Yeah, you, got, you saw Scarlet Witch and Hawkeye for one shot. But no Vision. No Vision, no Ant-Man, no Spider-Man. So there's a whole bunch of other characters are going to be in the film. Um, let's move on. We're going to talk about a comic book that came out this week. Yes, we're actually going to talk about comic books. They still exist. You can buy them they at do. stores called comic book stores. We're going to talk about a comic book that came out this week. It's called Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, issue one. So it came out, and it's, uh, it's uh, finally out. We've been hearing a lot about it. It's written by the legendary Frank Miller, who wrote the incredible Dark Knight Returns, and then a sequel we won't really want to talk about that much. But this third one is uh, written by Brian Azzarello, who is an incredible writer. He's known for his 100 Bullets, which I fantastically love and highly recommended to become either a TV series or a movie. And thankfully now it's becoming a movie with Tom Hardy. So very excited about that. It deserves, it deserves like five, six movies easily. Um, it's drawn by Andy Kubert and, Cla and inked by Klaus Jansen, who inked the original Dark Knight Returns off of Frank Miller's uh, artwork. Uh, is this movie worth, or not this movie, is this comic book worth all of the hype that we've been hearing. Now, I kind of went off a little bit on a bit of a diatribe maybe five or six episodes ago because it's it's inherent in the the kind of the, the, the little hair that most comic book stores are hanging by, this thread of uh, variant covers, which is something that I absolutely hate. It's something that helped destroy comic books in the early 90s, and it's a greed corporate structure that both Warner Brothers, not Warner Brothers, I'm sorry, but the DC and Marvel, the big comic book publishers were fighting amongst each other at the time in the 90s. And Image came about, which was formed by seven different artists who came from Marvel and DC and were like, we're gonna make our own thing. And they, and they did successfully, so they became a third large publisher and just started making comics more than they could possibly even handle writing or drawing. So they started hiring substandard artists to draw their comic books. Marvel and DC in and then went in hand like, hey, you're cor trying to corner our market. We're going to start publishing the hell out of all of these different comics and doing variant covers and gold, you know, rainbow covers and hieroglyph imprint covers. And and so what Shadowhawk basically from yeah, image, comics. Uh, you know, and comics at that time, believe it or not, millions were selling. Like, I think Youngblood, which is Rob Liefeld's comic, sold a million copies. Um, Spawn, that's why you see so many Spawns now, number one for like five bucks, because all these people were like speculating, it's gonna be worth hundreds, like they were that was using- That question. Some people were buying 500 each. Yeah, so the speculation like market is 
it's not what comic books are about. It's not you buy them because you love them and you read them. It's not about encasing them in glass and hoping that they go up to 100 bucks. So what happened with the speculator, speculation market is it basically bottomed out the comic book market and destroyed it. So you went from comic book stores that were like popping up all over all over America, there are comic book stores everywhere, and sales of comic books, oh, this one sold 500,000 copies, this one sold a million, to now cut Flash over to 25 years later, we're in 2015, and comic books, single issues can barely sell 75,000 copies per and month. And that's a big number. That's, that's a, a big, big number. number. You can I'm get like about... 100 to 125, 150 for a hit, and you do get rare exceptions, uh, right. Star Wars number one this year, was an insane, massive multi-seller, and it had almost 100 variant covers. Exactly. So we're back in danger land. So yeah, Star know. Wars, everybody wanted to buy it, but then at the same time, they did this like insane amount of variant covers where I'm like, how many different versions of a Boba Fett cover can you possibly have? Well, you can have at least 20, I found out. You can have like a sketch cover, a semi covered inked one a color one and then a painted one that's four of just the same cover but just different forms of it i just find it to be excessive and to be honest with you really gross and i think it's it's ruining the th the thing that i love about comic books and it's ruining stuff for brand new fans it's giving them the wrong message it's giving them the message of like buy it for the cover and not what's inside which is what i always hated about when i saw a bill sinkevich cover and I opened it up and it wasn't that artist. I always found that like, if, if at least the artist was of a, of a higher quality, you're like, hey, you got this one artist doing this painted cover, and you have another artist doing this really cool interior art. Usually it wasn't that kind of a same thing, but that's, I'm, I'm splitting hairs with that. What I'm really upset about is this variant cover thing. And before we even talk about Dark Knight 3, the, in, the actual content of it, what I have to say is I'm disgusted by the amount of covers that they're pimping out. And they had all of my favorite artists do a cover and I was like you know what you should do if you were smart and not jerks and greedy jerks about it you would put all these amazing covers together into a hardcover book and print that and call it Dark Knight 3 Master Race the covers they and may you, actually do that they just did that well, with the Star Wars ones. I certainly hope that they do that with the with this because the, the covers are great. They're all homages to The Dark Knight Returns. It has nothing to do, no, none of the covers that any of these amazing artists did has anything really to do with the, the master race. Well, it's all homages. To speak to that though, what's unfortunate is it doesn't help you with issues two, three, four, and five. You know, you come in and you, you, you bolster sales, inflate sales uh, right. artificially right. for the first comic, and what do you do for the rest of the story? You know, then then the the the, the sales crater oh, compared I'm sorry. to the it's other. It's called landfill, and that's where all those hundred thousand comics that no one's going to buy is. That's where they're well, it's, going. It also doesn't help the industry. It gets no. it gets people a shot in the arm to come in, but it doesn't keep you coming back and buying the rest of the books. You can see how the basic concept is supposed to work. Where like, let's say there's a cover you can only get if you order twenty five copies, and right. all comic book stores are working on super thin margins, and you were only going to get twenty of those, but you say, okay, well I'll go for twenty five. I can sell this variant for more than cover price because it is rare and that's sort of how the market works and then five other people if they take a chance on that number one then you have five more potential readers with a limited risk for the retailer right but the truth is it's wildly out of control and uh, I now agree here's with you here's guys. the even more horrible truth about that you order 25 you get this one variant you order 100 you get this other more exclusive variant you order a thousand you get the special Jim Lee pencil sketch which you know that you could sell to some sweaty nerd for seven thousand dollars if you order so what they're basically doing is they're forcing the comic book dealers the marketplace the people who own the comic book shops to over order comics to compensate to get these special issues that some nerd is going to spend an exorbitant amount of money on because they think it's going to go up in value which it probably will because it's like some sketch variant that they're going to encase in the cgc but nobody knows what that'll be worth in 10 no one, years maybe no nothing one, maybe nothing so it is all once again this weird speculative marketplace so it's basically pumping up or inflating falsely the ideas of what comic books are worth and not worth, and it's also falsely lying to not only comic book readers, but also the people who have comic book stores by supporting this gross use of of lying to the readers and making people have to over order issues to get stupid covers, you're destroying your own marketplace. And that's how I really think about it. I don't care that, you know, all I'm, I'm happy that comic book stores are, are still around. They're closing at a rapid pace because no one's buying comics. Guess why? Because this garbage, 
and also other things like where they keep rebooting everything. Oh, they, well, we've seen in statistics that everyone likes a new number one. Guess what? Not everyone likes a new number one. It's just you're going by these weird statistics because that's what you keep doing. You keep destroying and rebuilding, destroying and rebuilding. So there's 15 new Spider-Man number ones that an average viewer like someone who's like, I like Spider-Man. I'm gonna go into this comic book store and see what, oh, a number one, I can start fresh. That's what they're, they're saying. But it's the same philosophy. People are thinking, ooh, if I buy a number one, it's like, it's fake speculation. It is. You think, and if you look at really the most valuable comic books, it's never, unless you go back and you talk about Golden Age books, it's never necessarily the number one. Like if you look at uh, New Mutants, when was Cable introduced? When was Deadpool exactly. introduced? And like, I think Deadpool, other than maybe New Mutants number one, when Deadpool was introduced in the latter half of that series, 98, clo 98 it's, you know, the last, it was a hundred issue series. It's the last, second to the last issue, third to the last issue. And it's one of the most valuable because Deadpool became a popular character. Mm -hmm. Now, who would have known when that book was coming out? There was no speculation because no. no one knew Deadpool was going to go anywhere. Nope. And that's why it became a great comic to collect if you're mm -hmm. part of the, you know, if you want to collect that. But I think this artificial, that's why everybody, I'm going to buy number one. They, they're preying on that idea that all number ones are going to go up in value. It's the same artificial speculation and it doesn't keep people coming back month after month after month, which is what they should concentrate on. I also found that the price on this comic, I think it's four ninety nine or five five ninety nine. Five ninety nine and they're gonna put out eight issues. It's like, why would I even waste all my money to get this thin pamphlet when I, they're gonna come out with a trade paperback, which is probably gonna be twenty four ninety nine when I'm gonna waste how much money to get eight of them? It'll like be sixty probably bucks? Probably more than that. They're also gonna do collector's edition hardcover versions of each of these issues where the mini comic is full size and they're both bigger each issue is literally getting its own tiny hardcover that will go in a slipcase by the end. It, wow. It's a little overboard. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I'll start off the review of Dark Knight 3 Master Race. It's hit and miss with me. I mean, when I first heard about Dark Knight 3 uh, being a, a reality, I had mixed feelings right away because I felt like Frank Miller's fallen far from the, from the tree that he was involved in when he was doing some of his best work. Obviously, Daredevil, Born Again, Batman, Dark Knight Year One. All these, all these seminal works, Sin City following that, doing his own created uh, universe of this amazing Even film Even things Wars. like Hard Boiled and, and Hard Big Guy Boiled. and Rusty the Robot. Yeah, he was, on, he was on a roll and just creativity unleashed. So loved all that stuff. Sin City started to get a little repetitive towards how it, when it finally got to, I think it was to Hell and Back was the very last one. It was basically kind of just a, a hodgepodge of the first three Sin Cities kind of redone again. Look, I was like, it's still fun. It's still Frank Miller. I'm still in his world. I really love the Sin City movie that he co-directed with Rodriguez. I thought that was fantastic. And then the spirit happened. And then Dark Knight, whatever the second one was called. Strikes Again. The Dark Knight Strikes Again came out. And I was like, you mean you paid these guys a million bucks for this one person to learn Photoshop? Because it was like the worst coloring job I've ever seen in my life. Um, it just was written in this really kind of a mean tone, which I'm like, I get it. Frank Miller likes to push buttons and he likes to, you know, get people, hey, I want to I want to show people this and, 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 you know, spin them on their head. I thought it just it wasn't thought out enough. There are certain parts of when I revisited the Dark Knight Strikes again because I read the first two and then threw them away. Literally, I threw them away because I was so angry, uh, like, you know, going from the Dark Knight Returns, which I think is still. You read it right now, it'll blow you away. It is one of the greatest Batman stories ever written. A prestige format, 48 pages as well. Yeah, so you, mean, put, you just put those all together and get all four of those issues, which is where they got a lot of the ideas for Batman v Superman is from that original one, not, not, not the Dark Knight Strikes Again, which it did have certain cool plays with the way they used the Atom, the way they used the Flash to running to generate a whole city, things like that. There were certain ideas in there that were like, oh my God, that's Frank Miller. That's him operating on all, firing off all pistons because he's always able to take something and spin it and put a very unique look Look, a very unique take, just like Alan Moore, just like a lot of the great writers, Grant Morris, and a lot of them are able to take something that you see all the time and put a spin on it, and now you see it slightly different through a different lens. Frank Miller was able to do that, not so much with the strikes again. And considering, like, you know, 300, I liked, I mean, a bunch of the, the successive things that he kept doing just weren't hitting it. Then there was that, 
I can't even remember. Batman what, Holy Terror. That they <laughs> had Holy to turn Terror, into just Holy Terror. Whatever that was, that was just created a new character. Really, really bad. It was just kind of bad. It was so, jingoistic and racist, and it, it was it, yeah. You know, it was, it's, he, the he, 9/11 in the room. drove Frank Miller insane. Yeah. yeah. So elephant in the room. So this is called the master race. Is the elephant in the room? I'm yeah. waiting for that to sound less horrifyingly uh, dangerous and offensive because. I'm not super familiar with Frank Miller's biography, but there's like we know enough pieces have gone public to sort of wonder about his perspective. And it's not necessarily like I didn't read Strikes Again right. because I heard too many bad things. I didn't read Holy Terror because I flipped through it and it did not look like a great use of time. And from the plot description, which was basically Batman esque character fights towel heads, it just didn't sound like something I was into. Right. And part of the problem is that like Dark Knight Returns changed the comic book industry right. because it was new. And, and it did things people hadn't done before. But in the 20 years between that and Strikes Again, the comic book industry remade itself in Frank Miller's image. We got way too grimdark. We got yes. way too cynical. I and mean, the whole point is Dark Knight Returns doesn't have power as a like cynical, dark what if, if the whole world is just like that. Yeah. Then it's not a like, wouldn't this be sort of terrible if this is what the world turns into? Mm -hmm. um, but all that is to say, like, I kind of didn't hate this new number one. I didn't hate it either. But, but to speak to what you just said, it wasn't groundbreaking. You know, it seemed like it was retreading uh, old ground. And what I thought was interesting was all the characters that weren't quote unquote Batman. I thought the way that uh, they use Wonder Woman right. and the way they use Superman and then the mini comic about the Atom and the yeah. bottled city of Candor, all that was more interesting to me than the Batman story. The Batman story seemed, the whole Batman story seemed like it was the first five minutes of an episode of a TV show. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you think somebody's so-and-so and they're not so-and-so. Ooh, where's so-and-so? And it's like, I, I felt like that was kind of a cheat for a first issue because yeah. of course they're gonna tell you where, and it didn't, to me it didn't tell, it's not telling the story it's supposed to be telling other than with Wonder Woman, yeah. other than with the Atom. And let me, why do that mini comic? Let me, let me say this. Uh, like th how thin is this I don't even is this 16 pages I don't even know what it is but this is not the Can Dark Knight the Dark Knight Returns was 48 pages square bound prestige format four issues I know that was back in 1988 but this comic book I literally read in five minutes five minutes maybe five minutes tops but and you know what I'm it I looks was like, like it's 28, right, but 20. it does have the mini comic that's like 16 pages. Right. Or but some inside. of those pages, there's no dialogue, there's no story. It's a fight scene. Yeah, it goes by. It went by really quick. It did. It felt so. Look, I mean, like it, it depends on how fast you read, how long you look at the panels. Andy Kubert and Claus Jansen's art, I have to say, was really fun. It was, it was definitely. It felt like someone went back and looked at Frank Miller's art in 1988 and lovingly imagined what he would be able to do if someone if he was then now. So it's like really well drawn characters. Klaus Jansen was killing it with inks. Every panel was kind of like like living in a Frank Miller universe. I think Frank Miller was so nominally involved in this comic book. I think he basically got paid a big check, had a bunch of story meetings with Brian Azzarello, and Azzarello wrote it. I don't think Frank Miller wrote any of the dialogue. That's my guess from reading it. It didn't feel like Frank Miller's dialogue. I have every single issue of everything that Frank Miller has ever written. I'm a giant Frank Miller fan. I ended Except up rebuying. No, Back I have that in the hardcover. I bought the absolute version <laughs> and I reread it. Now that's when when I reread it without all the vitriolic hatred of like this is a disappointment. After rereading it, I did like his take on Plastic Man, how terrifying that character really is. You don't even know he's the most powerful character in the entire DC universe. And, and when you started to think about it, it's like, you're absolutely right. Imagine if he was insane. That's scary. So, I mean, there was, and it was, it was definitely had a tongue in cheek vibe to it that the first Dark Knight did not. It, it had its own humor to it, but it wasn't the same. It was definitely different. This one had a lot more of like little poking at the fanboy, having fun with the whole genre. So I didn't hate it as much like when I first saw it. You know what really it. disappointed me, I think, the most is that the way that media was portrayed in the 80s, like with in, in Chicken's American Flag sure. and like in The Dark Knight with all the television pundits, our world, it was parody in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. Our world has become that. Right. <laughs> you know, the, you watch Fox News, you watch MSNBC and CNBC or, or any of the CNN, our news stories have become what they were portrayed as uh, in the possibly 80s. Possibly worse. You know what? And worse. And this, actually... Well, this comic didn't... It didn't... It didn't break new ground. It wasn't prophetic. It didn't take us someplace. It didn't have a commentary 
we're just there now. Yes. And I was waiting to see what are they going to do that's new? Because when Dark Knight came out, it was such a revolutionary look at Batman who'd been gone for a long time. He comes back and the world, the terrifying world of the Dark Knight was so strange and weird and futuristic. This comic didn't do that for me at all. It felt like a standard. It could have been a legend of the Batman. Mm. Mm. How about you? Anybody you were going to say? Oh, it, it had only just occurred to me, but the depiction of media, you're right, is one thing that distinguishes this from, from Dark Knight Returns because there's nothing sort of like subversive or predictive or parody about this. And that might be fine. It might be fine that this is just going to be an adventure right. set in that universe that doesn't do the same thing. But there is a book at DC right now doing that. Uh, I don't know if y'all have been reading Prez. No. It's this totally bizarre, cartoony, like Dr. Strangelove-esque near future book. Is it about the kid president? It's about the kid so president. So they brought Prez, Prez yeah, they original did. 70s They relaunched Prez. the 70s yeah. Prez via the Sandman one shot, via the intervening decades. Okay. And this time it's like the accidental election of a girl who like got YouTube famous for getting her hair stuck in a corn fryer. <laughs> Like, All right. she basically, due in. to a, yeah. an anonymous like group and some electoral shenanigans, somehow she's our new president. And of course, uh, in the traditional model of the completely bizarre 1970s one, um, she's dangerous because she doesn't have these like political affiliations and ties. But the whole th world is cartoonish and absurd. And you get things like she's going to the hospital to visit her dad, and they're like, for an ad free hospital experience, <laughs> please. Blow. And I was just like, oh my God. So wow. it's doing that thing that's like makes you terrified of our today. By telling you an over-the-top comic book story. So what you're story. saying is Prez is doing what Dark Knight yeah, 3 which should be doing. Yeah, it hadn't occurred to me right. until you said that. Yeah. Well, wow. That it makes, is, has Prez been collected? No, the last issue is out uh, tomorrow, so. I think, and will be collected soon. And All I right, think well, I'm in that, you know uh, what? Yep, you That's just sold me on it. I'm interested <laughs> yeah. in Like, I haven't heard about it. You heard it here first or last. <laughs> Prez, check it out. It'll be a trade paperback soon. You know, the Dark Knight 3, one of the newer things that struck me, and I was telling you guys before the show started, 25 years ago, a pal of mine who's passed away, we were like coming up with all these superhero ideas, and we came up with a superhero idea for Superman. He was gonna leave this, you know, this before he left. All the things happen already. So you're like, look, good ideas. I'm glad they get ha they happen. You can't do all the cool ideas. But him frozen, I had him like off somewhere just frozen, and he's like he couldn't handle what happened to him. So it was kind of all done in flashbacks. And you see Superman frozen in this comic book. When I first saw that page, I was like, God damn it! But then I was like. Awesome. At least I don't have to do this story. At least whatever they're doing with this version of Superman frozen in ice because he shut down. I can't wait to see what Miller and Azarello came up with. What shut Superman down to bum him out so much? He's obviously alive. He's not dead. Right. He's just sitting there because he just shut down. He's like, did the world the way it is right now, the insane world that we live in, are they magnifying the world of 2015 in Dark Knight 3 and saying this world that we live in now is so insane that a character as virtuous as Superman just can't even deal with it anymore and he's just decided to sit there and just shut off. Well, John, that sounds a lot more interesting than the first issue of this comic. And <laughs> I know. I, 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 but I, I hope I have to eat my words. I hope book. that this I, I, I like, grows I don't, into it. I, I take no pleasure. I want everything that comes out to be good. You know, I, I was really excited. I came into you. I came into you on Saturday because I hadn't, you know, Thanksgiving holiday and I was like, I thought for sure it's going to be sold out. I'm not going to be able to get it. I'm like, did you have Dark Knight Three, the master race, and you're like, yes, I do. And no, you we have right 400,000 copies I, just I sitting where right. we're going to be burying I, I, them soon in a landfill. No, I, see, we didn't go for the crazy. No, I know, but I'm just saying, like, so do you have the we... variant cover by Scribble Scrimby? No, that's already been sold and pre-bought, and it's already in a CGC glass encased <laughs> something or other. <laughs> I just hoped I wanted more from it. I wanted an experience like I had. But you know what? It serves me right because I don't go... For 30 years, every Wednesday, I went to the comic book shop. Mm -hmm. And for 30 years, I got a new experience every mm -hmm. week. That new experience is no, no longer the case. Well, I highly recommend doing it. I do that every Wednesday now. I either go to I go to House of Secrets or I go to Meltdown and I get some comics. And I'll just, I'll just wing it. I'll be like, I'm going to pick this up because it looks cool. I'll check it out. And I'll, I'll try it. I, granted, a lot of them I never pick up again, but a lot of comics I do pick up. And I, I, you know. This is I, a you fantastic know, commercial for buy comics, kids. Yeah, you really should be buying comics. Don't be stupid. It's true. So it's true. But I went in and bought five copies. There I was. I was part of the problem. But yeah. I did give them out to my friends. That's not I went part and of saw the Creed That's for awesome. a second time and handed out Dark Knight Threes. That's before. awesome. That's the way you should do it. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be recommending the right you approach do is it handing them to friends III. and not putting them in a basement. To, yeah. You know, I think we. I can't weigh in yet on on the Dark Knight until I've read like issue up to four. Because like, right. I feel like I'm going to give it a chance. Reserving judgment. Yeah, I'm going to buy issue two, three, and four. And what I'm going to probably try to do is just not read two and three. And when four comes out, I'll read one, two, three, and four. 
and just feel how, see how it feels to be halfway through this new version of the Dark Knight 3. Now, here's the weird thing. By the way, don't get me wrong. It's not a bad comic. I really was intrigued by it. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I had a great experience. I love the weird Adam mini comic that was yeah, inside, it's very which weird. was cool. I mean, I really enjoyed my experience with the comic. It made me want to go back and buy the next book. I just, it didn't rock my world no. the way the original Dark Knight Not did. in any way, shape, or form. Not so my all. worry... I guess I don't even need to worry about it, but I still, I'm, my worry about it is that Frank Miller has just announced that he's doing a Dark Knight 4. Right. Not, like, that makes me think he's insane. Like, that's, when I, when I read that, it was like a week ago, he was like, well, I, I was so excited about what uh, Brian Azzarello did that I have already decided to do uh, Dark Knight 4, which is my true sequel. I'm like, wait a minute, I thought Dark Knight 3 is the it's sequel. It's a little odd to be throwing this one under the bus after helping that's him promote what I'm saying. it and putting it's, his name it on it as a co-writer. It was super weird that he was like, well, I didn't really have anything to do with Dark Knight 3. That's Azzarello's baby. So now I've decided to actually do Dark Knight 4, which is really misleading and strange and freaky and weird. And someone's got to get that guy back on his meds or have a long talk with him. Hey, dude, this isn't actually the way you should be doing this. You should wait till Dark Knight 3 is almost done. Like episode eight, you know, is is out. And then you're like, I had so much fun doing this. I've been doing episode Dark Knight 4. And everyone, depending on how Dark Knight 3 is received, might be loving it, might be hating it. So... You know, I know you're jumping on the, you know, the the Batman bandwagon and everyone's like Batman v Superman had so much to do with Dark Knight Returns, which is a comic that came out 25 years ago. It's like I'm happy about that. I just feel like almost 30 years ago, you know, almost now. 30 years like ago. It, this kind of thing is just it reeks of the kind of thing that I don't like, you know, where it's just like it's not even desperation. It's just, you know, hopping on the back of some weird creature and like, I'm going to ride this to the end of the, oh, shoot, boo, you know, <laughs> explosion. So, look, you know what? I, I, I still love Frank Miller, so I don't, I don't want to talk badly of him. And maybe this thing was exactly what he needed to get all that jump, the juices flowing. He's like, I saw, you know, we talked, we had the Dark Knight 3 discussions. Azarella wrote this stuff. It got me so excited thinking about Batman again and got me into the whole game plan that I was like, I've got a perfect idea for Dark Knight 4. And that's what, I. my guess is that's probably what he was doing, is the excitement of having this come out and kind of maybe getting over some of the problems he's been having. Like, I know he was going to do Buck Rogers and that fell apart. And all these things that he's been saying he was going to do just haven't happened for whatever reasons. Maybe this is the thing that he needed to get him back on the right path. So I don't want to be too preemptively judging like what's going on with it, but you know, I'll just, I'll wait and see. That's how my attitude with Dark Knight 3 is right now. So, all right, we've talked about Dark Knight 3 for quite a long it's time. It's a comic book show now, yay! Yes, <laughs> let's move on to something I like to call minor mutations. These are little quick snigs, little snippets of news and we're gonna talk about them. So number one, we've got Wonder Woman is set in World War One, according to all the brand new set picks that have been released all around the web, we've seen a lot of World War One, you know, people walking around in actual costumes for World War One. Number two, we've got Marvel turned down Del Toro and Neil Gaiman's Doctor Strange. That's Guillermo Del Toro, not Benicio Del Toro. <laughs> Guillermo Del Toro, Neil Gaiman's Doctor Strange. They turned it down this many years ago, but you know, what movie would have that been? Who knows? Chris Hemsworth jokes that he will actually beat the Hulk in Thor Ragnarok, and he said he better beat the Hulk. Um, will Reed Morano direct Olivia Wilde in Captain Marvel? She sure hopes she can, because she just worked with Olivia Wilde. She thinks she would be great to direct Captain Marvel. Simon Kinberg talks about the New Mutants. Will it actually happen? We've been hearing a lot about the New Mutants, and then it disappeared off the radar for many months. Let's see if it's gonna happen. Supergirl gets a full season order and she's going to have a crossover with that fast dude, The Flash. So let's talk about some of these things that pop off right away. Robert, what do you I got? told you Supergirl was going to cross over with the CW. I oh, told yeah. you. Has that actually been confirmed? It is. Yep. I Are, said that on the show. Because they denied it all day yesterday and the day before. They, they said not yet no, or no, no, not at this time. What they, and now what they said is like, if Supergirl gets a full season order, then we'll do it. And she just got a full season order yesterday. So I think that that's in the plans to do that crossover with The Flash, whether it's not official. I, I'm not official. I don't make Flash or, or Supergirl. But everything I've been reading and hearing seems like it's semi unofficially official. I hope they say, race. I hope yeah. they race. But yeah, that's not what I wanted to talk about. What do you want to talk about? New Mutants. All right, let's again, talk about New again, Mutants. Again, again, like, like the Teen Titans, as much as I love X-Men, to me, X-Men was kind of like my Star Trek mm -hmm. as far as comics go. I love the New Mutants. 
I loved everything about the New Mutants. The the Asgardian Wars New Mutants special edition when Arthur Adams drew it. Oh, fantastic. All, f- unbelievable. Jeez. And that whole, the Bill Sienkiewicz drawn Demon Bear, Bear. storyline in New Mutants. What was that, 18, 19, Oh, yeah. 20, I mean, Bill Sienkiewicz is just his, not only just his amazing painted covers, but then his interior art of Warlock. Warlock, I mean, yeah. uh, what a crazy character that nobody else could really do except Arthur Adams. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and uh, it was... I love the New Mutants so much. I can't even tell you how great a New oh, Mutants yeah. TV show could be if the tone was right. Mm-hmm. You know, because New Mutants was always kind of weird. Definitely weird. It was weird stuff. You had like the Val. What was her name? Valkyrie. She had the little uh, d- dragon, like a uh, little purple dragon. Kitty Pride and Sh- Shadowcat and uh, Lockheed. Lockheed yeah, was yeah, the cat. Yeah, yeah. Was the little dragon, but originally it was like that girl, the blonde girl. I'm forgetting her name. Well, she's just magic. Ileana Rasputin. Yes, thank you. And, and, you know, Peter Rasputin's sister. Right. And sh- that was all great. All those characters were great. Like, I know there's no chance this is going to be the perfectly faithful, like, early Claremont New Mutants story that I wanted to be. But I can't not want it to be. Like, this is the first uh, back issue series I went and hunted down was New nice. Mutants. Like, I don't know why, but, like, that original team, like, uh, Sam Guthrie, yeah, yeah. Roberto de Casca, uh, uh, that original lineup of New Mutants, the Marvel graphic novel number four, which was introduced yep. all of them. Like, and then if you're gonna do it, you probably want to jump to the Sinkevich stuff. Like, it, they could do horrible late New Mutants like well, nonsense. Well, they gotta start. They like, gotta start there, though. Right. They gotta right. They gotta start there, and and because it's a great, it was a great jumping off point. I mean, you really like those characters. I mean, when they got to issues, you know, that the, the Sinkevich stuff, then it got weirder. But it was it was such a great it was such a great series, and those characters you never thought anybody could replace the X-Men right. or interact with the X-Men the way that they did. And, you know, it was great to see some of those characters in Days of Future Past, too. I mean, you got to see some of those younger right. mutants. Um, and Versions it was, of them. Right, versions of them. But I love I would, those movies, but they pain me. I would love to see that. I mean, I, Ileana Rasputin was a great character. Mm-hmm. Rain Sinclair. Oh, so great. Anyway. So, yeah. We don't know whether it's happening, but we're clearly well, all in yeah, line. Simon Kinberg basically just said, we've got a script, um... The, the guy who's writing and directing it, I'm forgetting his name right now. Josh Boone? Josh Boone, thank you so much. Um, he did a great presentation. He's a giant fan of the New Mutants. So he I kind of wow, that to be he wowed everybody with like his like super nerd nerdgasm, you know, script and here's drawings of everybody. And I think it's he's going from a lot of the Sinkevich style stuff. So I'm really hoping I my fear though is like the way Simon Kinberg talked, if you read between the lines, he was saying basically like Boone did this amazing, like super nerdy presentation. We all we all got a kick out of it, but it was just a little too nerdy and too comic booky. So we're gonna have to change a lot of stuff and make it so that it adapt, uh, smooth out a lot of the weirdness and make it so it's a little more digestible to the everyman. That's what I read. And that's my reading between the lines where it was like, it was just a little too faithful to all this, the weird stuff that all of us really love. I hope someday that they will just say, you know what? That's exactly what we need. That's all that new juice that we definitely need to inject into this superhero franchise. This that, that's that's what we need. That's exactly what we should be making is right from the comic book. Well, you know they've 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 grounded the X Men movies so much, and if you look at Warlock, how would you explain even in Brian Singer's X Men? How do you explain Warlock? to that audience. If you've been watching, you've got to do it correctly. The they, way the Marvel Cer- Cinematic Cerbero, Universe... You, you have all that stuff. That's Warlock. You have you don't have to have him like with the weird... No, you know. but I mean, I think you've got to do it the way the Marvel Cinematic Universe has done it. They've slowly injected... I never thought Thor would work. Right. I'm like, how can Thor work but in the same universe almost, as Iron Man? But they came almost straight out the gate with Thor. Like, they right, were they pretty did, but, early with the Thor movies once Iron they Man. got Iron Man to, like, sneak you into your superhero right. Here's your it science, was, and woo! And Guardians know. of the Galaxy, who would have thought that that would have worked in the same universe? But it does. And they've just got to figure out a way to inject all that stuff in a very um, calculated and well-done right. fashion. Fox has to figure that out. Fox I, has to I figure think that out. what they should do is give Fantastic Four back to Marvel, because they're never going to do that anything with that except ruin another one. Um, they should just give that back to Marvel, and then Marvel can then, in turn, not only give Fox all of the toy rights back and all of the video game rights back and then start, you know, they could also maybe help them a little bit. Like, hey, here's here's what we would do with New Mutants. Let's, you know, let, let's be pals again. I think that Fox is never going to give up the X-Men, ever. That's well, never going to happen. Know, they've got a whole new series of movies coming it's, out. It's never going to happen. I'm excited for them, but it makes me so sad. I know, but that's the thing is like I'm not I'm not sad because that means an X-Men movie can come out almost a month 
right right in between Captain America or Avengers. So we get we as fans get more superhero movies than less. If it was just all in Disney's boat, it would just be like these four movies a year. Now we still get seven or eight because other companies are fighting for that money. They're like, no, we're going to release our version of X or Y or Z. So I think it's a win win situation. Everybody just has to learn to play a little bit fit more better. It's like, look, you, you, you shat the bed. Fantastic Four didn't work. You've had it for how many years now? All of them didn't work. Give it back to us. We'll make here. You can you can have this now. Here's your toys. This is the video game money that you're not making. Oh, that's a lot of money that you could be. Here's you know. Let's trade it up. I think them keeping the new mutants. They're going to keep anything that has the M word. Mutant is going to be that's Fox. They're branding that. They're doing Legion. They're doing the Hellfire Club for TV. I don't see why they wouldn't even. Hey man, why not try doing a new mutants television show? As a series, instead, that might work better than a one. Uh, and then you've got Excalibur. Oh yeah, you know you can add. Uh, there's a lot. You've got X Force. Yep. You you've got X Men. Uh, let's there's let's talk lot. about. Don't, don't greenlight the Nate Gray book yet. I <laughs> definitely <laughs> wanted to talk about Scotty's um, son. What do you think Neil Gaiman's Doctor Strange would have been like if Gil, Guillermo del Toro directed it? I know they were trying to do that, but this was this is sort of a similar Edgar Wright kind of a situation. It was like 2004 or five when they pitched it, so it wasn't. Marvel Cinematic Universe was not established yet, so I think my, it might have fallen into that same, like, you know how long it takes Guillermo to get any project going? It's like, you know, from the inception to then all of a sudden, like, oh, no, Iron Man and Hulk are out, and then, you know, it could have just well, fallen this, apart. This seemed like kind of a non-story. Like, it, it would have been really cool, but if so, they were saying it was like 2007, 2008, like, they weren't really in a position to pull the trigger on no, Doctor Strange no. at that point. No, it's just, but it's more I would have like watched the heck yeah, out of that movie. What, it's what For me, it's like, what, what could it have been that we still don't know what the actual Doctor Strange is going to be? So... So, you know, it's a it's hard to guess, really. I'm not convinced that Guillermo I, Neil Gaiman, The Sandman, is my favorite comic series of all mm -hmm. time, and and I don't think that Neil Gaiman and Guillermo del Toro would necessarily be the best people to work together. Hmm. I think that Neil Gaiman needs a director that will ground. He's so lyrical, and his his work is so um, literary that you would need somebody who's very cinematic. Whereas Guillermo's He's very esoteric and sort of baroque in the way yeah, he tells stories. Definitely. I mean, he, even his Hellboy movies, especially Hellboy Two, goes to a very fantastical sort of Miyazaki mm -hmm. place. But yeah. When you need, you need like you need the Russo brothers to ground. Although maybe the two of them would 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 be tremendous together. I don't know. It just I, I think it might be a good combination because Gaiman could provide the sort of the structure and story perhaps stuff that is sometimes only the the element that I miss in in like I love Del Toro, Del Toro stuff, but occasionally you're like if you had like a really genius storyteller to work with that right. would probably be great. Maybe this would have been that. Maybe I, that'll eventually happen. They'll team up on something else. You yeah, know? I think they will. I mean, look, I'm still waiting as I have been for 25 years for a Sandman HBO TV series, not a movie. Ah. Just adapt all seventy-five issues. That's all I need. That's just, all you need. Just adapt the issues right. the way they are. It might it's happen. Fine. Hey, let's get let's get into something I want to talk about. It's called Flashback, where we go back and talk about a, a superhero film that's happened. We're going to talk about. Guess what we're talking about this week? That's right. It's Batman and Robin, nineteen ninety-seven. The big dumb dump truck, the better best big winner at the top of the sky high pile up that of superhero garbage city. It's that golden turd topping the top of all of all that stinks. Com yes, comic criers and sweaty nerds. I speaketh of that which is called Batman and Robin, the worst of all the Batman films to ever exist, the worst superhero film ever made, a painful lobotomy to all the top senses, an aquatic stink fest of rotten celluloid. This embarrassing franchise, killing franchise assembled some horrible ideas and even worse execution that was possibly made by maybe a feral starving neon animal chained up in a demented misguided mutants 1950s time vault locked basement uh this was unleashed in 1997 let's pour over the horrible mix of dried stench that is batman and robin just wanted to get that out there folks let's start with you robert <laughs> wow i don't even know what to say after that that was amazing john um to me, this is the what is the word Nadir uh, of of all of all horrible, awful ideas. You know what this is? This is a product of a complete non understanding of comic book material. Yep, it's the idea that a comic book is just that. It's just a piece of newsprint with colored 
drawings on it. There's no understanding. There's no the tone of this movie. They don't even try and establish any kind of real world credibility with this film at all. I don't know what you're. I don't even know what I'm watching. It's not even the the '60s Batman television show is great because they said, okay, we're going to make a camp Batman series. So the entire tone of it right. is fine. But they try and go really serious with Bruce Wayne and, and, and Robin's relationship and Alfred and you're watching this sort of serious superhero film that is surrounded by, I don't even know what it is, gobbledygook that you should get out of one of those those uh, gumball machines you see it, those those big banks right. of gumball machines with the weird creatures in the capsules. It's, good, like, it's gl glowing neon acid that it, burns at the touch. Well, what's, what's so amazing about this film is it's so lavishly produced oh, yeah. and there's not one shred of reality. There's nothing in this you like to watch. Everything you see, every decision is wrong, every color is wrong, every actor is wrong. George Clooney is wrong, and he's good in usually everything. Here, let, me, let me say this, in the one defense that I can muster up to say something about Batman and Robin, a lot of people who are now, uh, you know, maybe 20, grew up as little tiny children shitting in their pants and stuff while watching Batman and Robin and grew to love it because they were three. And that was their first connection with the character Batman. So the, like while they were crying and pooping in their pants and watching Batman and Robin, that movie somehow like they grew up and then they became seven and eight and they were like, I love Batman and Robin. And then they be, went on and went into high school and they had these nostalgic fond memories of Batman and Robin. So that when they hear people are older talk about what a big giant pile of crap that film is, how it's literally just a series of horrible scenes glued together with some kind of horrible, like mind erasing glue that just like, it's it's a lobotomy. It's basically trying to watch that movie, yet other people are near and dear like, I love that movie. A Bane was cool. I'm, I just, I don't really know what to say to them. It's even worse than people like who love the Phantom Menace. It's like apologists who can't find the way to like, no, it's good. It's really good. You just don't understand it. No, I, I get it, dude. I'm probably a thousand times smarter than you, and I can out-talk you. But I understand how horrible it is, and you don't, is indicative of maybe why you're not getting it. So, I Batman can see Robin, someone remembering it fondly, but I can't yeah. defend anyone saying that it actually was good or succeeded at what it was trying to do. And I'm really glad that you called out the colors specifically, because out of a movie that didn't have a lot of memorable things, one thing I remember is like, I was a dumb teenager and I was an easy prey for most dumb superhero movies. And even I was just like, what am I looking at? The, the particular kinds of neon that they thought would somehow communicate their cartoony but gritty at the same time vision of the world. It, it, the choices were just unsuccessful on so many levels. You know what? I really get the neon use because I understand just the, the, the complete shitty version of what they were trying to get at. They were like, we want to go back. We want to, we want the Tim Burton stuff. Those Happy Meals didn't sell. The Penguin and Catwoman was too psychosexual. We want to go back to like the Adam West Batman, but like put a new spin on it. So their the designers were like, hey, let's go back to that Biff Bang Pow, but instead of that kind of color palette, like comic book idiots, the people who read comic books, they like color. So let's add glowing color. That's literally how simplistic that idea was transformed. It was like, take the old 60s Batman and then throw all this neon into it and make everything glowing. It's horrible to look at, especially you have a movie, 1997 is when this movie came out. It, not, it also ruined Tim Burton's like chance to make Superman lives. This was like one of the like final death knell for that that movie but this was also a thing where it's like this is 10 years after dark knight returns came out this is 10 years after it came out then you had batman the tim burton batman was taking a lot of oh that look at what this comic did that everyone's talking about this comic take some hints off of this comic and then you know batman was reborn so to speak and it did create that grim and gritty thing that happened in the 90s you did have batman year one you had a lot of really cool things happening in comic books in the 90s wasn't happening in but you movies. also had Batman the Animated Series, which was a totally. nearly perfect imagining of a larger-than-life, somewhat cartoony, but still internally believable and Glad serious Glad you brought world. that up. That was a fantastic version of Batman. That was, so we all knew yeah. about that when we had this movie put in front of us, and it was really hard to... Well, what's you know what I find really interesting is I, I keep harking back when I think about this movie to Flash Gordon, the mm -hmm. 1981 Flash Gordon, where it was also a wash in color, and there was no realism in it, but the characters were actually smart characters. Right. Like when you hear Prince Voltan or Baron, I mean, they're of course larger than life and big, but they're also smart. And, and Lorenzo Semple's script was really a smart script. 
And this, the 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 script is really led written by stupid. Oscar-winning Akiva Goldman. It's it's so. It's the characters are written so dumb. Like all of Arnold Schwarzenegger's one-liners. I mean, there's something right. there's something lyrical. If Neil Gaiman wrote this script, you might be able to get away with everything exactly the way it is in the movie. But the characters would have been smart and interesting. I mean, even I hate to say it, but but um, Mr. Freeze is his wife. You know, there's something really sort of lyrical about that, and it could have been lyrical. Said it was a frozen supermodel. I mean, it was just. So it was one bad choice heaped upon another bad choice that makes it, it's really unwatchable. I yeah. tried watching this movie recently and I was like, how bad can this be? It's really bad. It's horribly bad. Honestly, if anybody who tells me that they like Batman and Robin and they're sincere, it's like my, if they're like at a hundred percent, they instantly go to like 60. Well, as far as my, like my, my pre judging people judge you, believe me, people are always judging you. So if you say something like that, like, yeah, you know what, you know, I was young, but I, I love, I love Batman and Robin. I still do. You're going to like people who are smart are going to think you're stupid. So I'm just saying that or like people like me, you can hate on me. If you, if you love Batman and Robin, please feel free to write a bunch of horrible stuff in the comments. But you know, I, it's just true. It's a bad movie. If you grew up well, as a little kid watching it, you get a pass because it's like, look, it's hitting your nostalgia buttons. I get it. You loved it when you were four. And that's cool because that's what happens. People grow up and they watch stuff. And then you try watching it as an adult. You're like, nah, I can't really get into it as an adult. But I like the memory of what it did for me when I was a kid. I like the ideas of it when I was four or five or six. You can't watch it now as an adult because it's a giant stinking heap of garbage, but you can at least remember it in a fond way from the, you know, the kind of the weird uh, ideas that maybe like imprinted on you when you were kind of half watching. It's borderline it. offensive. It if is you, totally if offensive. A, if you're an astute movie watcher and you try and watch this film, it's insulting on almost every level. Every level is, it's as an adult, it's insulting on every level. So, I mean, you know, I know Schumacher has apologized for it. And, you know, I feel bad for him that he got the, the, the big heaping amount of, you know, everyone's ripping on him. He's done a lot of great films, too. And it's not just his fault. There was the entire production team. There was everybody who involved in Batman and Robin. They should all also hang their head in shame that the they war. were involved in the biggest, dumbest superhero film ever made. The executives well, so should take blame for this movie, too. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Every single, it's not just Schumacher, every single person involved. So it's like, it's a, it's a tie sometimes with me with like Superman for the quest for peace and Batman and Robin. They're both horrible films from beginning to end. The execution from the very beginning to the very end, horrible. So I don't know which one actually wins. Sometimes it's for me because, because Superman four was just like, just squandered and ruined by a bunch of jerky producers and they pulled the money and this and that. So it was already kind of limping out when it came out. I was like, I'm barely a movie, help me. Like a creature, like some kind of monster, like help me, I don't know what I am, I'm Superman four. Like, and then it explodes like a David Cronenberg movie, just guts all over, you're like, what did I just see? Was this Superman four? You're just covered in weird blood. Batman and Robin had everything going for it. It had an amazing franchise, and then they just like did a complete 360. Batman Forever was the 180, and then they just 360'd it and did Batman and Robin. So, I mean, Joel Schumacher's Batman Forever with Val Kilmer's Batman started that kind of that weird neon thing where they he add, started to add I certain things. I remember them both similarly as not very successful no, Batman, Batman movies. No, Batman Forever but... had the Riddler and had Two-Face, horrible Two-Face by Tommy Lee Jones just screaming every line. He was like very competitive with Jim Carrey, felt like he was like not getting the right roles. It was like there's a lot of weird stuff going on the set with that. I thought Jim Carrey's ex, you know, execution as the Riddler, when you watch it now, it's exactly like what uh, Electro, Jim, uh, Jamie Foxx did. He was like, I'm gonna be the Riddler and Mr. Freeze as Electro and ruin the Amazing Spider-Man 2. Um, it's not just Jamie Foxx that ruined it, it was the rest of the entire film. So you can't blame just Jamie Foxx, it was that whole film. This Batman and Robin, same type of thing. Everyone was trying. No one like Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't take on Mr. Freeze to be in a, in a horrible film. He was like, I get to be in the Batman movies. Too bad you're in Batman for. Well, the real, you know, I've what always said that Thurman. Yeah. the most successful superhero movies, I think what we have always wanted is we want to see a superhero movie where we look out our window today in the world that we live in and we see Superman flying outside our window. Mm -hmm. That's the superhero movies we want to see. That's why the Marvel Cinematic Universe works. That's why the, the Nolan Batman movies work because they, they're pretty much set in the real world. Right. And that's what we want to see. This movie, 
has no semblance or shred of our reality in it at all, which means it's totally alienating. Right. There's nothing that you want to see in it because you don't believe that these characters can exist. And the best superhero films, the best, you believe Indiana Jones exists. Yeah. You believe James Bond exists. You want to believe the superhero movies really started to work when they made you believe these characters could be real. Well, that's very true. There's that nothing in there, there's some middle ground where like both uh, Indiana Jones and the, they live in heightened worlds already sure. which are not necessarily just like ours I don't quarrel with the fact that they wanted a heightened world I just quarrel with the fact that theirs didn't work yeah right like I, I think I could have accepted like the, the way the Tim Burton movies uh, exist in a world that is not exactly like ours right. no. but it's an interesting artistically rendered world that is not right. quite like ours for specific reasons and so it works that's yeah. true that's absolutely true but All I right. Do you, need, you want to wrap it up? <laughs> well, I would no. I was just going to say, like you said, heightened world, like Captain America: The First Avenger, is set in a past, like Indiana Jones is yeah. set in a past, with super science and with Hydra and you know with the Red Skull, but it's still in the beginning when you have that great foot chase, mm -hmm. you know, when Steve Rogers chases after. It's still the streets of a totally. city you recognize. Well, that's what works in the Marvel world is it's set in New York, it's set in California, it's set in real world. You know, there's not like the difference that they always play up with like, you know, DC is Metropolis and Gotham and, you know, and then, you know, the Marvel is, this is New York City, this is Manhattan. You know, right. this is, here we are, we're in California. These are real places. And Winter Soldier, you feel like, oh, there's Captain America. He exists in our world. Like, it's not too much of a parallel Earth too. You see our cars and our things around, but there, there's that weird secret world of Hydra and, you know, she. Right, and look, you can come from Asgard back town to a small, what, New Mexico town. No, totally. Shouldn't you know? have worked. Totally did. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. All right, this week we, on Spotlight is BPRD. We are going to talk about the spinoff of Mike Mignola's Hellboy comic book series. It's uh, with a supernatural uh, super team set up at the same spot that employs Hellboy. He's actually part of it. It's called the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense, or BPRD. This team has enhanced agents like Hellboy, all with different powers. There's Abe Sapien. He's like an amphibious gill man. You have Liz Sherman. She's a fire-powered pyro. Uh, you have Johan Krauss. He's an ectoplasmic medium, among others. Uh, the movie Hellboy 2 is kind of like a, a basically like a pilot for the for a movie or TV spin-off version of the BPRD, but it never happened. Let's talk about the BPRD. Could it be a movie or a TV series? What would work best? How about you, Amy? What do you think? Uh, this it seems like it'd be a natural fit for either. This once again is one that has been on my like need to read list mm -hmm. forever. I've only read little bits and pieces of sure. Hellboy and BPRD, uh, but it's. Like, Mignola has now created for 25 years this amazing, internally rich universe oh, yeah. full of his own mythology and power. So I think if you've got the money to make, like, a TV show would be perfect. They've been doing BPRD stories in short miniseries now for... Totally, 18? yeah. So many years. There's when like, did they spin I have off into, three thick tomes yeah. and they're still on behind. I'm like, oh, I gotta got, get like three more. There's like 20 Guy Davis is work. the guy who's been drawing most of them. He's mm -hmm. a fantastic artist. Mignola writes a lot of them. It's been a very fun series. Robert, how about you? No, I agree. I mean, I, I think you might need a feature budget because of the makeup effects. I mean, Abe Sapien was a great right. character in the Hellboy movies. You know, Doug Jones plays him. Totally. And I, I think it's a great, I mean, I just, I'm a sucker for this stuff. All the way back to like Kolchak, the Night Stalker. Oh yeah. You know, give me, give me a, a paranormal investigative series that deals with the spirit realm and monsters and creatures. And, you know, I really wanted Constantine to succeed. Thank Same God here. they brought him back, you know. I, th For that's one, amazing. one episode, yeah. Maybe they'll bring it back again. But I love this milieu. You know, I think it's a great milieu. I think there's so many rich stories. And I do love the characters. Yeah, I, I mean, think... BPRD can be done on a moderate budget for a TV uh, for a television series because you can amortize the costs over. If you did ten episodes, you can rock that for thirty million. But then you get ten hours as opposed to right. fifty million for two hour movie. Uh, for it's a two sort hour of movie. confusing that we don't like given the current landscape. It's a little weird that we don't already have like the Abe Sapien spinoff and the Witchfinder spinoff. It's spin super and the weird. So I would like to correct that. Any weirdo executives watching this, get on BPRD and turn that into a TV series. It's a procedural supernatural right waiting to happen it's I just mean, ready to go you'd think but it, i think it should be on cable only because you might have the level of violence on walking dead occasionally and netflix hulu amazon easily can pick i mean that i'm up. surprised after a walking dead show which is one of the, the the biggest shows on tv which is essentially a, it's supernatural yeah the dead are walking right you know and and why aren't there more gritty or violent or apocalyptic supernatural shows other than of course supernatural, supernatural. right 
you'd think that they're successful. I mean, Sleepy Hollow is successful, Supernatural is successful, Walking Dead is successful. Why not this? Well, they're bubbling through. We've got the Outcast show coming because right, they specifically went to another Kirkman thing where they feel safe. And Dark Horse has been making more TV mm-hmm. deals lately. You got The Strain made it to. You got Why to the TV. Last Man being ad- ad- adapted into a TV series. I guess I'm You've wrong. Got There's Preacher. a lot of supernatural shows. You've got on TV. Preacher. But that's I think one of the, the biggest more. supernatural uh, comic book heavies that we've been waiting for years to become a series. Yeah. It's becoming a series. That's a, the mo- I'm the most excited for next year's Preacher. So it's hard to you know, like we we say a lot. Of that, uh, Ash versus the Evil Dead. If they can do it on now, and yeah. that got renewed for a second season. If that can be on, yeah. BPRD can be. Yeah, on. BPRD is in that wheelhouse, and I'm I'm just waiting. I'm sure like in the next few weeks we'll hear about it. So well, I think Darkers also just revamped like their media rights deal. I think they oh, they good. were working with a certain company and they're changing it up or. Um, can I a think. Grendel and Mage movie be far behind? Uh, maybe not. No, I think Let's that... hit the Twitter questions. Yeah. This week we got Victor Trevino Jr. asks, do you think that Blackhawk could work as a movie? Maybe a period film like Captain America 1. What do you think, Robert? Blackhawk. I, I, I love Blackhawk. I mean, I, I've got Blackhawk G.I. Joes. They're not hot toys, but they're still kind of cool. Oh, right on. I love the Blackhawk squadron. I mean, I lo- Chaken did a Blackhawk. Sure. I mean, I, I again, b- the problem is, you know, you've got guys in airplanes. Right. Which is inherently expensive because of the visual effects. But, I mean, why not? Why not do a World War One? You know, nothing Agent Carter proves yeah. that World War Two worked out. I mean, right. I mean it's World War Two, And if it, it's a period piece, make it like Indiana Jones. It's Baba Black Sheep. Meets Indiana Jones. You get, you, you could say like I'm still I'm hesitant about it myself personally. Like I don't you know I I remember even reading the Howard Chaik and Blackhawk a three issue miniseries and being disappointed. So it was like for me, it's a hard sell. I mean I remember as a kid I liked Enemy Ace and then just like you know Snoopy fighting that Red Baron it got boring after a while. Well in so. the Peanuts movie that was my favorite. I love seeing <laughs> Snoopy fight the Red Baron. I wanted that. I I went into the Peanuts movie wanting one thing. Snoopy fighting the Red Baron, and it was awesome. Oh, you it delivered got it. like crazy. Yeah, I think they, they, I think they went overboard. That's the one that the, when they went, they got to the fifth Red Baron thing. I was like, "Yo, dude, I'm checking out, son. God, I, I love can't it. handle it anymore. Too many Red Baron fight scenes." <laughs> That's where I'll argue with but you. But I think it, funny, could be, my, it could be good. My Blackhawk perspective mostly comes from when, like, because I didn't really grow up on DC. So when I was sort of jumping in, uh, Lady Blackhawk was in Birds of Prey. Ah, okay. Um, and she's so much fun that that just made me want her to pop up everywhere as the sort of like weird character out of time with a connection back to all that war stuff. Because it might, nice. like, I could see it being a tough sell to take specifically the war story area of these established comic book companies. Like, unless you're going to do some twisted, like, weird war tales take on them. Right. Uh, there's not, it's not the most natural thing. Like, but also we just have regular war stories. I mean, I would watch a right. Madame Zell Marie movie. Like I would watch that all day long, right. but it has to have some connection to DC universe. So people won't know why you're doing it. With you hear that Greg Berlanti, Lady Blackhawk shows up in flash or it could be <laughs> legends of tomorrow. And then they time travel back to 1940s. You get a Blackhawk episode. Bam. Oh, what happened to the sun? Needs to do a Black <laughs> that could thing. just that be, could that could so just, work. that would be awesome. So all you sweaties who work on the DC television shows, tell Berlani to get on that. So I think that's a great idea. Get those black ops in there. Twitter. All right, let's move on. Gino Nachef asks, what's the difference between comic book issues, volumes, trades, omnibuses, and graphic novels? I'm going to hand that over to the lady (laughs) here who works at the House of Secrets comic book store herself. Amy, what is the difference between a comic book issue, volumes, trades, omnibuses, and graphic novels? If you want to just let the viewers know. Uh, First of all, don't feel bad about being confused. Everyone is confused all the time uh, because even those of us who've been doing this forever were inconsistent with our terminology. Usually, most comic books, but not all, are published in monthly single issues. These are called floppies or single issues or issues, usually. Uh, But when you bind a bunch of them together, especially now that longer story arcs are the rule of the day, we will often refer to that as like volume one of that, volume two of that, volume three of that is the successive paperbacks or hardcovers. There was a time where there was sort of a distinction between collected trade paperbacks, which those volumes would be, like the, they, as in they're out to the comic book trade and they are paperback collections of comics. There was a time where there was kind of a difference between that and graphic novel, which usually meant something that was designed to be one full piece and had not previously been published in chunks. But that distinction became meaningless sort of as soon as it existed because you had things like Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen, which are perfect of a piece beginning middle end stories which were also serialized in chunks so therefore it's like well is that a trade or a graphic novel it's both there's no reason to try and figure out which one because it's obviously both uh 
So, graphic novel usually means it has a spine. Trade usually means it has a spine. Uh, volumes becomes a little trickier because we're used to using it for the beginning of a story, the next chunk of the story, the next chunk of the story. But it's also used when you're collecting back issues to indicate that they had a series called Iron Man for a while and then it ended. And then a few years later, they had a new series called Iron Man. And this one we call Iron Man Volume 2 because it is the second time that there has been a sequence of issues that are called Iron Man and we need some way to tell them apart. Wow, so they really screwed up now. The last like four <laughs> years, there's like 700 Iron Iron Man number ones. It's, it's getting like, really bad, especially now that Marvel, they have a bunch of really promising new number ones, and uh, some of them are the second number ones from the same year. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it's, don't feel bad for being confused, but there is some sort of internal logic. Usually it's just a question of whether you're looking for the thing that goes on a bookshelf or the single issue thing. Now, um, omnibuses and absolute oh, editions, yes. let's talk about that. Like, like this graphic novel here, This, these are floppies or also pamphlets, I've heard them call mm -hmm. I hate that terminology, pamphlet. <laughs> I'm like, don't call it a pamphlet. So it's like, <laughs> come on. So, you know, you have these issues and you collect those together and they'll probably, whatever, this will be a, a, they'll do a trade. They'll do probably they'll do a the fancy hardcover, hardcover and then later they'll do right. a paperback, most likely. And, and then, then probably. A bigger, big, tasty, super large slipcase edition, either DC, they call it Absolute. Mm -hmm and Marvel and then everybody else calls it omnibuses, right? Or doesn't it's, DC have omnibuses as well? They're not doing well? omnibuses as well. They, these are not exactly like strict terms that have specific meanings, but they're terms that get used in a customary way. Okay. So I think omnibuses too have a completeness to them. Like for instance, I just got the the I hate to admit this, but the onslaught omnibus. You did? That uh, I did. It was like a hundred bucks too. Right? That's from when I started reading, and I have an excuse because I didn't know any better. Oh, what? It, 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 you know, I've been getting all of the. I love the Marvel omnibuses, and I've bought most of them. But the thing is, it will collect all of the om, uh, all of the onslaught storyline right. in one book, which some like of them really suck. All, yeah. of the, all of the all of the all of the spinoffs, all the different comic books. But it's the entire story. Now, some Marvel omnibuses will take an entire series. Like you can get Alias that Jessica Jones is based on. Which you should do. You yeah. can all get of it. you should get it. Yeah, it's in an omnibus. There's what, 28 issues of Alias? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's all in one and book. And it just recently reprinted because yes. the original omnibus, which I had then I sold for some tasty money because I knew they were reprinting it. And I was like, eh, I might as well uh, get some of that tasty flavor money. And then, oh, uh, here it is again. Super cheap again. But well, you know like what? 100 bucks. Right, right. Still, it's 100 bucks. Yeah. I'll say that they have put out the new Teen Titans in omnibus format. Yeah. But if George Perez didn't draw it, it's not included in the omnibus. It's not every successive issue. Right, so they're missing is, issue 39. Right, which is yeah. really annoying. Because like annoying. Issue, when Paul choice. Kupperberg came on and was was drawing, there was like issue 30 with Brother Blood, right. who's one of my favorite DC villains. Can you believe millions like, of people know who Bl Brother Blood is? I, I love that. John Byrne <laughs> also drew Brother Blood. I mean, Brother Blood is my perhaps my favorite DC villain. It's pretty cool. He has a skull mask. Uh, yeah, he was awesome. Yeah. But that was why I like Omnibuses, because you can get the entire... Like, I've been reading Ed Brubaker's uh, Captain America sure. storyline nice. in Omnibus format. I just read The Trial of Captain America, mm -hmm. and now I have to get... I haven't bought it yet. Someone wants to send me it. The Return of the Winter Soldier Omnibus. Right, and Steve yeah. Epting and Jackson Geis busting out some amazing artwork on that. I can't wait to get that. I was, I was recommending just last week the Planetary Omnibus. Omnibus because they have all the all 27 issues of Planetary plus the three specials all chucked in there. It's incredible. I now I've got Planetary. Absolute Planetary one and That's two. what I'm talking about. Well, it's not the but Absolute. Now they, I know, but they just released. Uh, yeah. Am I missing those three Planetary? There are certainly absolute are. Planetary. Yeah, no, I have both of the, have Absolute Planetary one and two, but the Omnibus has all of those plus the three additional like, oh. uh, Planetary meet Batman and all that the other stuff. That's, world stuff. Yeah, the Crossing World See, stuff. Yeah, I gotta so, get that. Yeah, so these do. are different terms for fancy hardcover collectible versions of these things and it's either the story beginning middle and end or a complete chunk within the story usually for omnibuses yeah like they're great plus well, another thing about omnibuses especially the marvel omnibuses is most of the time they're recolored and yes. they're on larger paper so the the comic book drawings are on is big are bigger so you can see more same with the Sometimes absolute recoloring versions. is a bad thing but most of the omnibuses seem to have tried to do a fairly I've, faithful not yeah. wrecking i have to say that the thor jack kirby tales of asgard Hardcover reprint was completely recolored, and I loved it. Really, 
I, oh. yeah, I know a lot of people don't like the, you know, the, Hey, I don't like them recoloring those old, you know, sixties comics. And sometimes it doesn't work, but whoever did the job on tales of Asgard for, for me at the very least, cause I have all those issues and I read those when I was a kid and I loved them so much to see like a different taste, like with slightly more modern, it's not, everything's all extra shaded, but they just did a good amount of recoloring and shadowing and light effects and stuff that it really works for I love me. That you're calling that out because that's a specifically one that I don't like, which proves that it's sort of a like it's different strokes. There's, there's definitely an audience for it. That yeah, that that one for me because I had those as a kid was so much fun to see it in a new light. That it actually. What if, people, what if people want to read the old ones and unlike you, they weren't smart enough to get all the single issues? I think that's what hurts me is I want to be able to sell people the original right. version. Right. Well, you know what? The good thing about those, those tales of Asgard, are the reprints that were made like in the 70s and 80s of those, is which is what I, I have. I didn't have the original ones in the 60s. I got the reprints that they made in the 80s are cheap. You can get those for less right. than what you would buy these recolored ones that yeah. I'm getting all sweaty about. You can get just the the just the actual. Hey, here it is. Not in a CGC, you know, flappy. Some a million other kids read it. Buy it for two bucks. You can get it at any convention. Ask somebody for a Tales of Asgard, the cheap versions, and then you get those right there. That's a good point. But I think some of those versions, like I think the definitive Sandman is the absolute Sandman yes. because they were recolored, but they're beautifully done. I mean, yeah. they knew it was already a hugely successful, influential comic. So they took the time. Mm -hmm. So to me, I would much rather read. Maybe this is sacrilegious. I'd much rather read my absolute editions than my original issues. No, there's nothing wrong with it. To, you know, that's that's the thing that makes all these different editions great. Let's move on. <laughs> We've got two more questions. We're almost. We got a long episode going on today, guys. Uh, King Joker asks: Since Doctor Strange was referenced in Captain America two, when in the Marvel Cinematic Universe timeline do you think he got his powers? So. They're already saying, well, Stephen Strange already is, exists in Winter Soldier. So how many years earlier did Doctor Strange pop off? Was he coming around just when Iron Man was popping off? Or where do you think he comes in? Well, Stephen Strange was a doctor anyway. Right. He but doesn't he wouldn't necessarily... be a target on anybody's hit list, yeah, right? Yeah, and all, all, also he could just be a, a government, uh, a think tank operative. I mean, he might not be the Doctor Strange we know now he's just Stephen Strange. No, they, they Do you said think he would have popped but, up on their threat index? But he might be he might just be a he might be a Bill Gates type of a guy. He might be a geneticist. Hmm. He might be we don't know. I mean, I don't think it necessarily means that Stephen Strange is the Stephen Strange of Doctor Strange fame. He's maybe he's just a scientist. Maybe I'm gonna, he's dealing with I'm gonna say I think he is Doctor Strange when they're making that the Winter Soldier and that when we see the origin of Doctor Strange, it will take place maybe even before the Avengers have formed, it'll be like, this Iron Man just popped up. But if he is, would he be able to be taken out by a helicarrier? Hell no, but they might know about him. They might. But they would something... put him on the list for sure. That's true. He's right. on a list. You've convinced me. But right. he's so young that they, this makes... Like, if he were the middle-aged Doctor Strange that we're sort of used to in the comics, this it would I would say, like, for sure, he's already the Sorcerer Supreme. He's just keeping it all under wraps, and the movie will be when he can't keep it under wraps anymore, and it spills out into the rest of the world. Definitely. Like, but but Benedict Cumberbatch is so young. He has to have time because, I mean, if he if he's a geneticist or a government operative, I guess I'll be fine with it. But my instinct is to say if he's not a heart surgeon who's a total jerk, I'm walking out. Like, and you have it takes time to become a heart surgeon yeah. and have a personality and get that personality changed by a, like, horrible car accident and then rebuild from that and then go off and study mystic arts. Those take years. And then so to get the Sanctum Sanctorum, happened. just that real estate in New York. <laughs> It's got to cost a pretty penny. And when the mindless ones are released <laughs> on the streets of Manhattan. <laughs> or maybe he's able Strange. to do that only after the uh, right. Chitauri attacked New York. Maybe that's when they, maybe yeah. he's in Hell's maybe Kitchen. Maybe he bought a really cheap uh, building. Because, I yeah. think he, he very possibly could be in Hell's Kitchen. So I would say he's probably already the Sorcerer Supreme. It's just just weird to tr figure out that timeline. Well, I think they'll probably drop a hint or something. He's like looking at a newspaper when he's got the beard and he's all straggly or something. Like, Iron Man? Huh. Who knows? Let's move on. Here's the second to last question. We got Tarney asks, do you think we'll ever see a superhero film from a single bad guy's POV? So Super Su uh, Suicide Squad is more of a collective. Will we see like, you know, Stilt Man, the movie? And it's just his perspective. Like, I will someday conquer Daredevil. I'm just joking. They're not going <laughs> to use Stilt Man. But uh, do you think like, you know, they're going with Sinister Six. They're going to have a team of supervillains. Will we get a one-shot super villain movie told from their perspective? Closest one I could think of is Venom. How about you? You know what? A Clockwork Orange, while it's not about superheroes or mm. supervillains, is clearly from an anti-hero, a very villainous man's point of view. He even narrates the whole movie. I could see doing a Clockwork Orange-esque 
supervillain movie. Definitely. You'd need somebody who has a deft touch. I think Martin Scorsese, man, maybe a different version of Taxi Driver, but it's from a villain's point of view. I think that could be really cool. But again, how are you going to sell somebody on making a movie about a guy or a woman who's essentially horrible? Well, that's going to do terrible, horrible things. I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to really quickly, we were talking about Jessica Jones for a minute. I, it's before we get to the sweaty question of the week, let's take about five minutes to talk about Jessica Jones because what you just said sparked it off. I was like, you know what? She's a bit of an anti-hero. She's a bit, she's very, you know, she's a confused gal. She's got issues. And I thought, I thought the series was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. I know a lot of other people here, even here at Collider, who like didn't like it or had issues with it. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought it was. It's one of the the best series that Marvel put out, and it goes toe to toe with Daredevil. In tone, they're completely different. Yet I feel they fit together perfectly. I agree with you. I thought I binge watched the whole thing this past weekend, mm -hmm. and I was surprised at how adult that yeah. show is. The adult yep. material. And how, how about a show that's almost all female protagonists? Yeah. The male characters, other than the Purple Man, other than Kilgrave, are on the periphery. Right. But it was a show, what a great, strong female character show. I mean, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought the first half was better than the second half. It got a little scattered. I agree. The last five episodes were kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. But I thought, really, what a fantastic and dark, dark, dark Yeah, the show, show creator, showrunner, Melissa, I think her last name is Ro Rosenberg. Rosenberg? Yeah. yeah. I thought she did a great job at Fantastic. maintaining uh, the character, Jessica Jones, who was unlikable. And I liked that she was unlikable all the way through the entire series. I didn't need to see a story arc or a character go through some kind of redemptive whatever. It's like, yeah, but if you didn't buy into her relationship with Trish, you don't have a human heart in you. I agree. <laughs> I think her relationship with Trish was the, the center point of the entire series and I'm not going to give spoilers, but at the very the end, the last that last little line that you think she's saying to this one person and says to the other person was the if you don't if you didn't get it, then you just you don't get it. So that's if it, it didn't mean anything to you and thought it was a throwaway line, you didn't understand the entire series. So it was fantastic. Uh, that's the way to do a villain show. I mean, yeah. she could very well have been on the other side of the law. Very, Kilgrave almost brought her over. I mean, there was like points when like you're like, is she playing? What kind of long game is she playing? Because she was playing with some pretty dangerous elements somewhere in the middle. So what it's are your thoughts on that? It's funny because I... I, I I can see her as an anti-hero in terms of that she doesn't have the likability factor of heroism. I, I found she was pretty squarely always on the like the the side of the angels. Mm -hmm. It's just that she doesn't feel welcome there or that she belongs there. And also she's kind of rude and mean to people, which is like, hilarious. But you know, not yeah. traditionally a heroic trait. Right. Um. And and so in that sense, like she's not the kind of anti-hero who's like always wondering whether it met whether they'll just let a bunch of innocents die she's never wondering whether that's a good idea right she's always pretty clear on those boundaries but like but it's it definitely works as a very different kind of hero and a very different kind of heroic show and i absolutely loved it and i, I love the introduction of luke cage i thought the way they brought <laughs> that character in and his relationship with jessica jones was fantastic i thought her and Trish's relationship was fantastic, and it was like watching that develop over the over the thirteen episodes was was really cool. I thought some of the misfires was the Simpson new character. I thought I, I liked the way he was brought in, and then kind of like became a bad guy or whatever. I was really tired of him in the middle, but then by the like the payoff was really worth it yes, for me. <laughs> I agree. The payoff with that character was very satisfying. Yeah, it was very that. satisfying. But I'll tell you something. Uh, what I really thought that show did really well is first of all. Could they have cast a better Luke Cage? Probably not. No, he He's was the perfect. greatest Luke Cage. Yeah, light. I cannot wait. I got a chance to visit the set of Luke Cage when I was in New York like two months ago. I don't want to do any spoilers at all, but all the sets are fantastic, and I cannot wait. The ser the Luke Cage series is going to rock your world. I guarantee you. It's fantastic. is Jessica Jones going to be in it? Not saying anything. Uh. I'm just saying I was on the sets. I saw some stuff. It looks amazing. So. Well, I think what was really interesting was how dark that show went, yet, as you were saying, to speak to your point, there was still a lot of light in it. There yeah. was still a lot of humanity, even though it got as dark as it could go. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't pull any punches. Well, you definitely check out Jessica Jones. It's on Netflix right now. You can totally binge watch all of them like I did and totally got sweaty and finished my Daredevil. Everyone was like, when are you going to finish Daredevil? I finally finished the last like three episodes of Daredevil. Fantastic. Fit, you know, Vincent D'Onofrio deser deserves an Emmy. That guy's insanely awesome. Can you believe awesome. we got Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin and David Tennant's Kilgrave the same year? Unbelievable. Like, I'm still unbelievable. shocked. 
<laughs> it's it's unreal. All right, here's the sweaty question of the week. It uh, comes from Paul Bruce Sampson. Do you have any tips for a writer of original content trying to break into comic book writing? Any tips for a writer? Well, I think there's never been a better time than now to write a comic and self-publish it. Yeah. Whether you kickstart, well, you and I are both people that have, have done a lot of Kickstarter work yep. and made money. I mean, you don't have to wait anymore to for to be discovered. Right. You just got to start writing and putting your stuff out there, whether it's digitally. I mean, I know you, everybody wants to write for Marvel or DC, but the only way to do that is to start writing. You have to demonstrate that you can write comics. Yeah, and absolutely. You, the way to do that is to somehow get a comic together. Yep. Find. I mean, that's how all comic book creators started. Yep. You know, writing comic books starts right now. Go pick up your pen or start typing at your laptop or your Surface Pad, whatever. Uh, and do it today and now you are a comic book writer it's, the only way you can do it is to start it's obviously tough to find collaborators but a way I've seen a lot of people do it is contribute to anthologies mm -hmm. um, that is a fantastic thing a lot of times they can hook you up with someone uh, there are like there was a contest that I think just closed that Mark Millar was having which was uh, for new writers and artists who wanted to who could submit without a partner uh, there are contests there's the like the top cap talent hunt uh, there's a million places to self-publish uh, if you go to cons you can meet artists that you can work with yep uh, there's there's more roads than ever, and there's no one proper one. But there like is, studying yeah. your craft and making comics are the ways. Yeah, and and don't be afraid to reach out. And like you're a writer, if you want to make comics, guess who you need? You need an artist. So you got to reach out. Um, go on different forums. There's Deviant Art. There's a lot of different comic book forums where you can find and meet people who are artists who want to draw comics and they might you know you can there's a lot of uh, especially here in LA and New York and um, wherever you're at you can like look it up online and find a place where other comic nerds are going to meet up and talk about comics you're going to find an artist there if you're an artist and you need a writer you're going to find a writer there and it's important to like mix and match and find the person that is doing the right kind of comic if you want to do mystery comics and the writers talking about superheroes that's not a good fit what you want if you want to write superhero comics and you find somebody who draws draws superhero comics but draws it the way you like then I think that'll fit right you can't really you know I think it's really important to find the right team for comic books especially like how I usually the comics I pick up are if it's a writer I like or an artist I like if it's a writer artist team that I love that's an amazing comic because you know that that synergy is going to be there with whatever they're jumping around to so that's that's case in point criminal then we've got um what is it? The fade out, which is, you know, that's a kind of the team that I just, man, anything those guys. Ed Baker, Sean Phillips, yeah, buy it. It's fantastic. Anything they're writing, I'm buying it. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't care. Crocodiles and baby possums. I'm buying that. It's Brew well, Baker. It's, like, it's also like, like an Eric Howell book. Yeah, Wolfman right? and Perez, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was what made that comic book. That was as much a part of the, the art right the arting the artist and the writer together that synergy yeah. was what made that book irreplaceable and you have to start somewhere so like they said start now start writing write your comic and then get an artist to help you make it and then if you are able to publish it try to try going on um not even at kickstarter there's other crowdfunding sources indiegogo there's a whole bunch of different things where you really don't have to raise that much money to print a comic book what it does take is a lot of time more so for the artist so if you're a writer you could probably pop out a comic book you know 22 pages maybe in three days most likely two weeks so take your time make sure it's awesome then give it to the artist because it's going to take them a lot longer to draw that comic and ink it and then get someone to color it and then do the letters so oh, you know resources uh look up jim zub he's an indie writer who's been posting a lot of really helpful uh information over the last couple of years actually he's written uh, skull kickers he's got one called wayward right now but he does updates on the actual business of sort of getting oh. into it and getting into it as an indie publisher nice. and how he got his image deals so and how do you spell like his last name uh, it's like Zubkovich or something, but he goes by Z U B. Jim Zub, Jim um, Zub. has written really well on on the sort of starting out troubles and the actual economics of smaller publishing and all of that stuff. Awesome. Well, hey, we've we've run really long here. <laughs> we've been on episode. It's like feels like episode forty eight. It was actually episode thirty five. Uh, you've been watching Collider Heroes. I want to thank my guests. Robert, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or Facebook, Robert Meyer Burnett, or on my project site, which is SaveTheFederation.com or KlingonVictory.com for Star Trek Axanar. Awesome. Amy Dallin, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter at EnthusiAmy. Uh, you can find me in a lot of places on Geek and Sundry. I do a live show there on Tuesday nights called The Pull, and we do a fun guest filled silly look at the history and silliness of comics called omnibus with a lot of wonderful guest stars 
and on my own YouTube channel. Awesome. And you guys can follow me just at John Schnepp and uh, on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to www.tdoslwh.com. You can get the digital download. It's got the movie and eight hours plus of extra features. Support independent film. Buy it for someone for this Christmas gift. It's going to be, uh, you'll get a kick out of it is all I can say. Thanks again for watching Collider Heroes. This is episode 35. I'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.